optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is in the perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. I reached out to these Finnish entrepreneurs after a very talented acrobat introduced me to one of their products, which blew my mind in the best way possible. It is mushroom coffee. What on earth is this? Well, it includes chaga mushroom, very powerful antioxidant, considered a superfood. I was introduced to chaga by Laird Hamilton, the king of big wave surfing of all things. And it includes another mushroom that is considered a nootropic, a smart drug, and this is lion's mane. In the entire packet, you just add it to hot water, it tastes like coffee. There is only 40 milligrams of caffeine, so less than half what you would find in a cup of coffee. So you, I do not get any jitters, I do not get any acid reflux or any type of stomach burn. And it put me on fire for an entire day, and I only had half of the packet. So this stuff is really amazing. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement. Right now, this is the answer. So it is legal. It will not give you visuals. That's something else. And you can try it right now by going to foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. That is four sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C, foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim, and use the code Tim to get 20% off your first order. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley, have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, etc. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim, take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they would put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15000 which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally, when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me, uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account. But just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast, it's free. There's no downside that I can think of. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to attempt to deconstruct world-class performers from all walks of life, whether that be sports, military, entertainment, business, finance, or otherwise. And this episode, we have the fearsome Dane himself, 
known as DHH, David Hannemeyer Hansen, lots of vowels and a double S in there, just like my last name. This is a multifaceted character, and we delve into a lot of stories and details that I don't think he's discussed at length anywhere else. He is the creator of Ruby on Rails, and we'll certainly dig into what that means for those of you who are not in technology. He is a founder and the CTO at Basecamp, formerly known as 37 Signals. He is also a best-selling author and known for being very, very outspoken. We also, I suppose, meander into a discussion of the power of being outspoken. And he's also a world-class race car driver. He is a Le Mans class-winning racing driver, despite the fact that he didn't even get his driving license, his driver's license, until he was 24 or 25. You can find him a number of places on Twitter, at DHH Medium, where he writes longer form content at DHH as well. And on Instagram, uh, he does spend a lot of his time taking photographs at DHH 79. That might be lesser known, but certainly check that out. And we really bounce across quite a few different subject areas. We talk about tech. We talk about running a profitable business without venture capital for more than a decade. We talk about his 13 years of open source with Ruby on Rails. And we talk about stoic philosophy. We talk about flow states. We talk about racing. And I will warn you in the very beginning for the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, we have a lot of racing talk. It is relevant to what comes later because we're looking for, again, parallels across disciplines and first principles. So I'm not going to dig into a bunch of stuff that you've heard a hundred times about DHH before, if you're familiar with him on Wikipedia or in his books, for instance, we wanted, or I should say I wanted, that's the royal we, to dig into his rules. What are the rules he follows? The philosophies that he uses as his personal operating systems for creating excellence on this planet. What does beautiful code mean to him? How does that translate to other areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So without further ado, as I always say, please enjoy my conversation with DHH. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Uh, it has been a long time since we've chatted, and uh, we were we were of course talking before we started recording, and I couldn't pin down how we first came in contact. And I think where we arrived was somehow through Seth Godin when you guys were first considering publishing rework. We connected to talk about all sorts of things, ranging from split testing titles to the entire publishing process. And that must have been, what, six years ago? Yeah, I think uh, 2010 was when we started shopping our manuscript around. Or maybe that was even when we published the book. It's, it's so weird. It feels like it was just yesterday, and then six years later, here we are. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, it started in part in, in the same way that I started on learning a lot of things. I try to identify whoever in that domain I want to learn from and then figure out a way if I can either work, learn from them directly or indirectly. And of course, if you can have a direct uh, link, that's the best. And I had read For Our Work Week um, sometime in advance of that. And so I had Jason, my business partner and co-author of, of Rework. And we were both just impressed with that. And we're like, hey, this is this is kind of the path we want to take. Let's see if there's a way we can learn from what you've done. And, oh, here's a connection. Oh, Jason knew Seth and Seth knows. And there we go. So we're going to get into certainly programming and everything else. But since you talked about seeking out experts, I don't actually know the, I don't know the answer to pretty much any question I'm going to ask because that would be boring for me. But you I'm just looking at some cliff notes that I have here to go off of, but you, I didn't know this part. So you did not have a driver's license at 25. Is that right? Around that? That's right. Negative? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, let's flash forward. What happened at 34? Um, I got to stand on the podium after 24 hours of racing in a town in France called Le Mans uh, in the greatest endurance motor race in the world, fulfilling my... <laughs> Um, dream of not only just completing that race, but but winning our class there, and <laughs> all that in in nine years from not having a driver's license to getting a driver's license, learning how to drive a normal car, um, 
and then getting into racing and climbing the ladders of racing until you're at the top. So if if we were to try to find the parallel example to you reaching out to me and I'm sure other people about publishing, two questions. One is, how did you decide? Like, was there a moment or a dinner or a conversation where you said, yes, this is what I want to do? And then second, how did you start trying to figure out how to go about it? Sure. So one thing I, since the mid nineties, I had on Danish television, just tuned into this race, the 24 hours of Le Mans, caught it uh, a number of years and always just fascinated by the speed, the teamwork, the endurance, just the whole process of driving around in circles for 24 hours straight and making the machine last, making the humans last and just found it that absolutely fascinating. And then in the late 90s and early 2000s, a fellow Dane, um, we're talking about Denmark here, this is a population of 6 million people, 6 million Danes total. So when another Dane does something remarkable on the world stage, um, other Danes take note. Maybe that's true of all countries, but I think it's especially true of small ones because we just don't expect it, right? You don't expect that out of such a small country, you're going to have someone who reaches the peak. And we had Tom Christensen, uh, who now goes by the name Mr. Lamar because he's won the race nine times, uh, started winning races and started winning the 24 hours of Le Mans just over and over and over again. So that, of course, piqued my interest, too. I was already sort of interested in the race. Um, then a Dane started winning it all the time. This is still before I even have a, a driver's license. But this just plants the seed, right? Mm-hmm. I'd already been playing lots of racing games. I loved uh, racing games all the way from the Commodore 64 to uh, Sega and Nintendo's and Amiga and all sorts of video games. Probably racing games was one of my favorite genres. So played a lot of video games. Then all of a sudden at 25, I'm, I want to go on a vacation and I go, actually, if I go to Brazil or the United States and I don't have a driver's license, that's really annoying. Like you want to arrive there and you want to rent a car. The funny thing is I I wouldn't even think about driving around Copenhagen because that seemed like such a foreign concept. I'd already made it 25 years in Copenhagen on rollerblades and the occasional bike in between them getting stolen. Um, (laughs) And that seemed to be well sufficient. Copenhagen is not that big of a town. It's very well equipped for people who want to bike or rollerblade or whatever. Um, So it wasn't even to use it in my own country. It was like, I want to go on vacation and I want to be able to rent a car. So I learned how to uh, drive a car in Copenhagen, um, which was in itself a a funny process because most people, even in Copenhagen, I think if they learn how to drive a car, they learn how to drive a car at 18 or whatever, right? So it's kind of like new and exciting or what have you. And here I am, 25, I'm trying to learn how to drive a car. And I, at that point, I already knew programming. I had uh, already worked on a, a number of domains that I had taken sort of a methodical approach to. And I took a pretty methodical approach to learning how to drive the car too, to the point where the guy I was doing the exam with um, was remarking on the fact I was self commenting I didn't even realize that at the time. Like, <laughs> wait, the, wait, the guy so- who's grading me whether I pass or I, I don't pass it right next to me in the car, right? I'm driving around and I'm like, oh, I should have turned in a little sooner there. Oh, I should have turned on the blingers there. And it was funny. He told me, <laughs> oh, you pass, of course. But what was really remarkable was that you were narrating the whole process. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, actually, I don't know, maybe that wasn't so smart. I guess it worked out, (laughs) but I was basically pointing out all my own flaws because that's how I learned. So that's how I learned how to drive a car. Then um, skip forward just a little bit. I I Well, actually, you know what, David, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt just for a second. So two things. Um, The first is, do you do that self-commentary for a lot of things? Yes. You do? There's like a running narrator just running in my head when I'm trying to learn something constantly pointing out, oh, you could have done that a little better, or let's try this next thing on the on the new run around. And I mean, in racing in particular, you get that enjoyment a lot because the lap isn't that long. It's usually two minutes. So every two minutes, you get to reset. You, and, you have a take two. You know, yeah, exactly. You have a take two and take three and take four. And by having that running commentary, I'm kind of taking notes on this is what I have to tweak next time around. Uh, and I, I do the same thing in programming too. I mean, I'll look at a piece of code and I go like, Okay, let's get this working. And then I go back. Okay, take two. Let's make this right. Mm -hmm. Okay, take three. Let's make this beautiful. Okay, take three or take four. Let's simplify this. Okay, take five. Like 
just having that commentary all the time about where can I improve? Where can I get better? Mm-hmm. That's, I, I don't know where it comes from, but that's just how I've always gone about learning things. Did either of your parents do that? Or any, I don't know if you have siblings, but... A lot of these things on, on learning techniques, I've talked with other people around them, like these things have been codified and I would go like, oh, that's interesting. I just, I didn't know that that either had a name or that was how people were doing it, that somehow, I, I think I just stumbled over the fact that, oh, if I do this, I learn faster. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me just do more of that. Right. Of course, that makes that makes perfect sense. So I, I I interrupted you though. Oh, the the other second part, I apologize. Was what did you do differently compared to other people when learning to drive for that initial driver's license test? Is there anything that you that you recall doing differently or focusing on in particular? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. One of the things that I and I had these things with programming too, where I'm actually a slow learner at the beginning because. When I don't understand how something works, I have a very hard time putting it into action. I can't just, oh, let me just clone whatever it is you're doing. I don't understand it and then do it well. And I remember in Copenhagen, all the cars we were um, being taught to drive on were all stick cars, manual cars. So you had to operate the clutch yourself. And I could not get my head around the fact that clutch engagement, lifting the pedal from the floor was such a fussy process. Like he couldn't tell me how much do I have to lift my leg to get the right <laughs> touch engagement. He's just like, oh, just go on the feel of it. And I'm like, no, no, I want to know, like, is it 30 degrees? Is it 70 degrees? Like, how far does the clutch have to come up the floor? <laughs> and I must have stalled that car a hundred times um, because I just kept going like, I'm not just going to do it if I don't understand how it works. I'm going to figure out like how this clutch thing works because then, I mean, I'll know how it works and, and that will help me move forward. But it just other people would walk in, right? And they'd just go like, oh, you just go how to feel. And they'd put in the clutch and they'd let it out and just give it a bunch of gas and somehow it'd work and they'd get off the line. And I would just still sit there stalled trying to <laughs> do take three, take four, take five on getting the thing going. Um, so there was that aspect of it. And then the other aspect I was so impressed about, and it's funny, I still remember this. This is 11 years ago. I was so impressed with the writing quality of the of the text. So we would have both the practical part where you go out and drive the car and then you'd have like the theoretical part where you learn about the rules and so forth and just remember being remarkably impressed by the narrator of this incredibly dry material right like oh if you see this sign then like it means this and that and the other thing and the narrator was just entrancing because every single word had just been picked to perfection in a very bureaucratic stilted way but still i was just oh this is just so fascinating so it actually helped me learn the material that much quicker because i was just paying so much damn attention to how the guy was telling us how these signs were and how far from the curb you had to stop and i was just like wow everything can be interesting if you find a way to look at it the right way and if you have a way of telling it in the right tone um even if it's the driest material in the world. And he wasn't trying to make it peppy. It wasn't like the narrator was being funny or whatever. Just being ultra precise with every single word weighed and picked to perfection. Well, it sounds like that probably, and, and we're, we'll dig into this a little bit later, but your past two or past three example of making your code beautiful. I think that it seems to perhaps relate to why you're entranced by the precision of the language and the elegance of the language in that presentation for driving. Exactly. Same thing, right? I, ever since I've tried to strive to write code the way that whoever wrote that instruction manual for how far away from the curb you should park could write, which I actually think correlates pretty well to programming. We do a lot of things in programming that aren't inherently interesting. Uh, if you read some of the programming greats, they talk about, oh, we were building a uh, salary compensation system for Chrysler or something, the C3 system, which is kind of legend now in the uh, agile world. And you go like, that's got to be the most boring domain in the world. Like you're programming a system to come up with all sorts of deductions and exceptions and so on. How is that interesting? And oh, little do you know, once you dig into it and you unravel the mechanics that go into it, it is just fascinating. And I think that some of those experiences have taught me that anything that looks boring on the surface, you just haven't scratched far enough. Keep scratching and everything becomes interesting. No, I could not agree more. And I, two, two things came to mind. The first was, and I'm going to be wading into dangerous territory for me because I'm getting outside of my competency real quick, but it seems like the 
the instructional videos that you were watching are almost an algorithm for human beings, right? So you're still, it, it was imparting instructions and steps and so on to human operators who are going to be interacting then inside this machine. The, the second is uh, my personal litmus test for good writers is, uh, at least in the world of nonfiction, those people who can make topics you assume to be boring absolutely riveting, right? Because anyone can take the most exciting topic in the world, and even if they yes. f- just throw together the equivalent of spaghetti code, right? It's just like sloppy prose. As long as the story is really strong and they're given uh, kind of a, a Willy Wonka golden ticket in terms of subject matter, you, you don't have to work very hard on the words and the precision. But then you take someone like John McPhee, for instance, uh, anyone who hasn't read his stuff should, uh, M-C-P-H-E-E. He's written entire books on oranges. He's written entire books on uh, hand-carved canoes. He wrote one on Plymouth Rock. He wrote another one about an entire, and he wrote an entire book on a single tennis match between Arthur Ashe and I'm blanking on the the second folk. Uh, this is the, the second competitor named Levels of the Game. But his ability, he can take any subject you could assign him and make it much like Michael Lewis, right? I mean, he wrote a thriller about credit default swaps and uh, just make it riveting. Uh, so, so coming back, I know I'm. Uh, prone to making us digress, but uh, so you pass your driver's test. At what point do you decide to race? It's funny. I didn't even decide. I had a friend who had actually met online again. I mean, the whole reason I came to the US was because I met a guy online, um, Jason Fried, uh, through a blog um, and an email. And we got working together, and, and a couple of years later, I moved to the U.S. to work with him full time. And here's another guy I met online on a forum, a discussion board for cars, um, who said, "Hey, I um, I know of this racetrack that's just 45 minutes out of Chicago. Do you want to come?" And I was like, "Cool, it sounds interesting. Let's go down there." And we come down to the track, and he had set up with another friend that I could try a race car. Up until that point, I don't know, maybe I. had I don't remember. Maybe I had driven once with like a, a street car on a course or something. But this was a real race car. This was a single seater. You sit in the middle of the car. The wheels are exposed. They kind of look like miniature Formula One cars. Um, and I get a chance to ride in this thing. And I just remember, first of all, these sessions were about 30 minutes long. You get out on the track, you drive around for 30 minutes, or you, maybe it was even just 20 minutes. And it felt like it took 30 seconds because I would just see the flag right away and be like, wait, what? I have to come in? I just started. Um, So time was already being distorted, which is when you know you have a good time is when you can keep track of time. Right. And not only that, I was just absolutely fascinated from the get go about this whole closed system that we have this track. A lap around the track was about a minute 30 and you would get instant feedback on how well you were doing every single time you came around there was a clock telling you oh this time you did in one minute 31 four then you go around one minute one more time and it's one minute 30.8 and you go like man i just shaved off six tenths this is the most exciting thing in the world (laughs) and i mean that's even taking it beside the fact that it's exciting it's a loud car and it's shaking and there's the element of danger you could go off course you could hit something but just the closed loop system of improvement was absolutely intoxicating i mean it was, it was kind of like um you just had like a bottle of flow you could just go open your fridge and like oh i'd like some flow please can you get me into the flow state where you lose track of time and where you just have such a great experience learning and getting better like that's how i felt the first very very many times i got into a race car was i could just switch on flow which was something i had discovered in programming a fair amount but i i find at least in programming it was a little more elusive it was like the best programming sessions i'd have flow but then i'd also have a fair number of other programming sessions where i wouldn't have flow when i stepped into the race car i just felt like oh i could just you turn the ignition and flow comes and that was just magic. Why do you think it was more? Why do you think it was more elusive in programming? And can you identify any common factors for the sessions that had flow or that didn't have flow? I think part of it with racing was just the intensity level was at a hundred percent right away. 
You had, as soon as you stepped into the car, you had maximum danger. Actually, you had more danger in the beginning than you will have later on because it's much more dangerous to drive a car on a track when you don't know what you're doing than it is later on. Versus with programming, I didn't get flow until I was, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I didn't get great consistent flow in the quantities that I'd like to enjoy it before I was actually a fairly well-developed programmer because that was when I had enough of an eye for the whole scope of programming to really dive into, oh, let's make this beautiful. Let's make this as simple as possible. When in the beginning, I was just focused on, oh, let's get this to work. Can an, can the PHP page render? Oh no, I get an error. Let me try something else. That was fun. Um, there was glimpses of flow, but the real moments of flow, uh, I wouldn't get until I was much better. Where would, would Stepping into the race car, you were kind of forced into a situation really early on where developing your eye for this domain just was, I mean, it putting it a little bit of on, a, on a pin, but it was life and death, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, You're going 160 miles an hour. If you don't get this next turn right, at the very least, it's going to be expensive. Uh, and then it only gets worse from there, right? Either it's going to hurt or it's going to be really, really bad or there's going to be an ambulance involved or something else like that. And I think there's just a survival instinct that sharpens the mind in that sense um, that, I mean, when I'm trying to get make a PHP page work, if I make an error, it's not like I have to write off a car or go to the hospital, at least not the kind of software I was writing. Um, <laughs> maybe you get that if you try to write a pacemaker on your first go or something. But I was just writing information systems and, and web pages. But as, as things progressed, they became more the same. When I got sort of well-versed enough into programming that I had developed an eye for and developed opinions about what was good code and what was bad code, what was smelly code and what was clean code, it became a lot more fun to try to go from oh, this is just something that just works, to, which to me then became uninteresting, right? Like any programmer worth their salt, generally speaking, can get something to work, right? Like can get the program to roughly perform the task it's supposed to do. Um, at least in information systems where the domain itself isn't like that novel, perhaps, uh, or it's well-established enough that getting things to work, okay, that's the baseline. But beyond that is getting to make it clear, picking the right names, making the code beautiful, making it succinct, uh, simple, all these other pleasures you derive from code as pros, code as writing, not code as putting mechanical things together. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with racing, um, you, you had the sort of interest right from the get-go because you had this criticality, really high criticality. Um, but then as you developed, it became more of the same. Like once you start understanding grip and slip angle and all the mechanics of setting up a car in terms of uh, caster and rake and ride height, and you start appreciating the differences between two millimeters up front and two millimeters on the rear or tire pressures, it, it becomes really interesting in a, in a deeper level than just like, oh, I'm just holding on for my dear life, I'm trying to survive. Both things provide flow, but they're different kinds of flow. And perhaps the later part is the more satisfying part, because it's, as you say, when you can write a whole book about a single tennis match, you've really understood the problem. You've really understood the details that matter. And with programming and with race car driving, once you get into those nitty gritty details of, as I mentioned, all the particulars of the mechanics of a car and, and slip angle and wear of tires and so on, there's just so many factors. And again, it becomes system thinking, system optimizing, and just a riveting thing of trade-offs and optimizations and so forth that um, just is, is, is the path to flow, is the path to flow. Details, uh, developing an eye, that's for me the most reliable way I've found to cultivate flow. And, and like you said, if you, if you haven't found something that grabs your interest about a given topic just keep scratching right you haven't you haven't dug deep enough for instance i wanted to do get involved with archery for a very long time in a, in a serious capacity and i only started doing it about a month uh, let's see three months ago and part of what triggered it was an olympic 
uh, archery coach who suggested I get, I get a book called Shooting with Back Tension. <laughs> I, th- I think I'm getting the title right. It's an entire book about how to use mid-back tension <laughs> to fire more accurately and make the process more replicable. And for whatever reason, I just found this so fascinating (laughs) that that is what enabled me to finally take it seriously because that was the hook. That was the lure that I needed to bite. Uh, Let's rewind the clock a little bit because we've alluded to it, but there are people who won't have the history necessary uh, to put some of this in context. The story of not wanting to be inconvenienced in, say, Brazil or U.S. with by not being able to drive. That was sounds like at least one of the primary catalysts for getting a driver's license. That uh, sort of potential frustration. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, the programming came out of uh, starting a gaming news website. You mentioned the the racing games earlier. Is that how, how did that come to be? How did you start coding? It was actually exactly the same thing. As I said, like I learned how to drive a car because I didn't want to be in Brazil or in the U.S. stranded or reliant on buses or whatever that would make it hard for me to sort of enjoy that vacation. With programming, I came to the same conclusion, actually. I had almost consciously avoided becoming a programmer for a long time because I grew up uh, with a lot of programmers as friends. Um, and I was involved with computers, not as a programmer, but around the edges of it. I ran a um, what was called a wear site, a um, BBS, a bulletin board system before the Internet, where mm-hmm. we trade pirated software and so on. I was I was well involved in the scene of computers, but I wasn't a programmer. And I had kind of decided at some point, I don't know, 13, 14, when I had these programmer friends and I saw what they were doing and I thought, like, that's not for me. Like programming, it kind of looks like math and math is interesting, but it's not really what I want to spend my time on. Programming is not for me. So it took several years after that until I started working with the Internet. I started working on these gaming websites and I would pester my friends, my programmer friends. Hey, can you help me make this happen? Can we make a content management system before things were called that? Um, And they would help me and I would kind of just get frustrated because I felt a little helpless. I felt I couldn't be self-sufficient. I couldn't just make the things happen that I wanted to make happen in much the same ways that I wouldn't want to arrive in the U.S. or in Brazil or whatever I had imagined of these destinations were that required a car and feel helpless, like I was dependent on someone else. And I think that's a thread that goes through a lot of things and why I choose to do certain things. I have a definitely a streak for wanting to be Mm self-sufficient. And that self-sufficiency then led me to think like, ah. Okay, fine, I'll learn ASP or whatever the Microsoft thing was that we were using at the time. And then after that, okay, fine, I'll learn this PHP thing just such that I can make the other thing that I really want happen. I want to make So it wasn't a decision to become a programmer. It's like, all right, you know what? I will just figure this out so I can do triage so that I don't have to wait for A, B, and C person to get this done a week from now. Exactly. That was it. It was it was a tool thing. It wasn't like, oh, this is my new pursuit. I'm going to be a programmer. Absolutely not. It was, I wanted some programs. I wanted some websites actually. And I found out, oh, you kind of need to do some programs to do that. I taught myself HTML and CSS and JavaScript to, to do some of those other things. And I just resisted learning programming for a long time simply because I thought, oh, it's math. It's hard. I had these cons- notions about what programming was because I had observed the programming friends I had make demos and 3D graphics and games and all sorts of things that actually it's programming, but it's a very different domain than working on information systems. So I picked up this tool trade in much the same way as someone goes like, oh, I have to put this piece of furniture together. Uh, Which screwdriver do I have to use? Okay, that one. And then let me just read the instructions. Let me just try to put it together. It's not because they're trying to become a carpenter, right? (laughs) Just trying to, (laughs) I just want this uh, desk put together. I'm not trying to make a career as a carpenter. I just want a desk put together and Ikea has some instructions and I need a screwdriver. That was how I felt about it. And I felt that way about it for several years. And it was just funny because it was kind of one of those things that snuck up on me where with race car driving, for example, like there was a lot of intent. I did the first thing and I immediately got hooked with programming. No such thing. I did the first thing and I actually didn't enjoy it at all. I didn't enjoy programming very much. I thought it was just kind of an inconvenience. But 
I just kept doing it. And as you say, you just slowly start unpacking the onion and the further you get into it, the more rings you get into it, the more interesting it becomes. So fast forward a couple of years in 2001 or whatever, I'm, um, I'm done with this gaming website I had been building for a Danish incubator. There was a lot of uh, Danish um, <laughs> uh, .com inspirations going on at the time. And one of the things was incubators who would throw money at kids like me to build things with no idea of profits or a business model or anything else, just because eyeballs. Um, anyway, I kind of saw the writing on the wall um, painted pretty clearly when .com bubble bursted in the US. And I thought, yeah, let me just go back to university for a while. I had stopped after high school, went straight into building these gaming websites of various kinds, done that for what, three years or so. And then the whole bubble thing went pop. And I went, I'm not 100% sure what else I'm going to do. I'm not going to keep just spinning around the scraps here. Let me just try to learn something. And I got into a program for business administration and computer science. But at that point, like the snowball was already rolling. I had already gotten enough now of a taste of programming, again, not because I wanted to, but because I had to, that it was it was kind of getting more interesting. And I was getting more fascinated by just building information systems of various kinds. And these gaming systems, that was all they were, right? Like they were content management systems, they were message boards, they were all these kinds of information systems. And it had just really piqued my interest. And um I hid away in, in university for three years getting this degree. And, and at the same time, I, I, then I really got into it, right? Not so much because of the schooling, because uh, schooling was all about some nonsense Java stuff, um, where I guess it was good to get exposed to that, that, that did provide influences for later work. But it wasn't the schoolwork that was interesting. It wasn't because we were getting excite assignments that I thought was so, so fascinating. It was all the stuff I was doing on the side. And one of the things I was doing on the side, too, catch the tales of the story here was I started working with Jason Fried, who I would end up becoming a business partner with. And that stuff then went from, oh, okay, I guess this is kind of interesting to like, oh, it, this is actually pretty interesting to all the way until 2003, when I finally find, find the love of my programming uh, language life in Ruby and go, oh, actually, this is what I want to do with my life. How did you uh experience those jumps in other words what made it interesting right because there are certain moments in time where i can pinpoint for different skills or topics like it went from not interesting to interesting right it's kind of like it, not boiling boiling there was a really clear yep. shift for you what was that for programming and then and then why i mean i'm, I'm sure you're you might be sick of explaining this, but this that so the first is why programming generally? Like when was it like, oh shit, this is really interesting. And the second is why Ruby? Sure. So the first thing certainly came first, which was why is this interesting? And the first big aha moment I had was when I reached self-sufficiency. When I got to a level where I could make a whole thing, a whole feature, a whole part of the site without having to consult someone else, without having to stumble through it, where I could actually just put this desk together. And it was a pretty good desk. It served this purpose. I could put things on it. It wouldn't fall down. And I'd go like, huh, that's actually pretty cool. Like you can take something, you can take an idea and you can start writing things in a text editor. And all of a sudden you have an information system. Wait, that's actually pretty cool. So that was the jump point from the standpoint of, I like the outcome. That wasn't the jump of the, I like the activity itself. I just, I really like the outcome. I really like the self-sufficiency. And I like the idea of taking nothing and turning it into something. And then I had perhaps uh, another jump when I started working with other people. Um, I started working with Jason. Uh, Jason Fried, um, as I said, was uh, not only... A business partner at Basecamp, but he was also the first guy who paid me to program. All these other endeavors I had a program were more like side chefs. They were not the main thing I was supposed to do. I was doing this program for the gaming websites, not because someone had hired me as a programmer, but because they had paid me some money to run it, or I was just interested in running it. And then I just, through that, gotten self-sufficient enough that I kind of knew my way around PHP at the time. And then Jason 
um, I, I ended up connecting with him and he ended up hiring me, paying me the grand sum of $15 an hour, which um, <laughs> I was going to say back when the dollar was worth something. Um, now the dollar is actually worth a, a lot more again. Um, but I mean, again, my comparison frame was, OK, I could either get 15 bucks an hour working for some strange American I had only met online from Copenhagen, Denmark, or I could go do another student job of, I don't know, filing papers in the library or something. So, hey, that seemed pretty good to me, right? Like I get to do some programming stuff, which I'm getting more interested in. And someone is paying me 15 bucks an hour, which, by the way, funny anecdote on that. It wasn't even 15 bucks an hour because I, back then you couldn't really easily send money. Um, <laughs> so you got so, like a 20% well, I mean, he, transactional he, cost. He would, exactly. He would send goods. He would send Apple goods. So he would send like the very first iPod was part of my payment. I got an iBook, uh, a bunch of kind of stuff like that. Anyway, just wanted to think back about it. And then I, I worked with Jason for a couple of years on a variety of uh, client projects. Um, 37 Sickles, which was the name of the company before we changed it to Basecamp, was doing client work, uh, mainly design work. And I would team up with them and work on the programming stuff. But the big jump where I went from just liking the output to loving the activity itself really came with Ruby. And Ruby, I discovered, um, I think maybe in late 2002, I had a small look at it. And then again, in the mid of 2003, I really dove into it because we started working on Basecamp, our first sort of major product together, Jason and I. Um, we had worked on some other stuff earlier, uh, a site to keep track of your was it yeah your books uh called single file that i had made in php and, and that was good fun it was good learning experience never really took off it didn't go anywhere so we scrapped that a few years later but then this base camp thing came up we wanted to keep better track of our customers um all the clients we were working on we were doing everything over email we just kept dropping the ball all the same stories of when you try to manage projects and people over email it's you go in the beginning oh this is wonderful you can just send an email and then at the end of it you go like ah oh, shit where's that email like i can't find it oh did you tell peter about this oh no i thought you and like he doesn't have the right version of the file all the usual stuff you get when you try to do that you still get today when yeah. people try to coordinate projects over email right so we thought hey we're building websites for clients. Can't we build a piece of web software that would make this stuff easier? And so we did. So as I, we started on a project, I went, hey, this is not a client project. No one is saying you have to use PHP, you have to use ASP, you have to use Java. No one is mandating technology we have to use about this. And I had read about Ruby from some other programmers that I respected, uh, Dave Thomas, Martin Fowler, and others had been sort of writing in industry magazines about this wonderful language that they also couldn't use at work, but they used it to explain various concepts. And I thought, hey, here's a chance. I can, I can use a brand new program language. Let's just give it a try. And I set myself this challenge, basically. If in, within a week, I felt like I could get things up on the screen that talk to a database and so forth, it'd be enough to continue. And if within a month, I felt like, okay, I can build all the things that I realistically would need to build something like Basecamp, we're going to do it. And of course, it took like three days for me to be like, oh, I can make things come up on the screen. I can make everything happen. And then it took another, what, four days to go like, yeah, I don't think I need to programming it in any other programming language ever again if I can help it. This is wonderful. This is like, I liken it to sort of you take LSD or something. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this, uh, this, this, uh, a uh, gif of the guy that just goes like poof, where his mind is blown and he sees the galaxy and, and so forth. That was a little, without over-dramatizing it even more than that, that uh, <laughs> what I felt like, right? Yeah. That this is what I've been waiting for. This yeah. was the, the glove and it just fit my brain so perfectly. Huh. I just went, wow, this is something else. And it's so deep. I can keep pulling on the thread. I This was... Easy enough to get started that I didn't get frustrated, but deep enough that I couldn't even see the bottom. Right. I just kept going and going and going. I read more and more of the standard library for Ruby. I read basically every library that had been released at the time. I just went, this is truly something else. And then I started building. I just started building, 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 building. And the purpose in, in the beginning was just to build Basecamp. And what I found was I was trying to put this desk together and 
okay, I could see sort of like this is a beautiful tree. Like this is the sort I want to use for it. But like there's no hammer. There's no saw. There's like I have to build a bunch of these tools first. But I go like, oh, no problem. This is wonderful. I'm having such a great time. I don't mind that I have to build all my tools for myself first. So I started building all these tools, which then became the web framework Ruby on Rails. Um, and that was that was basically my first projects in Ruby. And I'd been a professional quote unquote programmer as someone paid 15 bucks an hour for two years at the time. But it was just that aha moment where you just go like, this is next step. And it really, seriously, it didn't take that long, maybe a couple of months into it where I just went, this is some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. This is some of the most rewarding, interesting challenges I've ever had to tangle and deal with. And there's just more every day. I simply just could not wait to get back to the keyboard and develop my eye, dig deeper, get better. Um, it was just, I, I really felt like I found something like you're not supposed to. <laughs> As in, like, this is almost too good here. This is like, I, I knew programmers, I knew they could have fun, but I didn't know it could be this good. Especially because I'd been doing some version of programming for years in advance, and I'd, I'd never felt like that. Now, you, you mentioned there are, there are a bunch of things I want to dig into because I love this story. So the first is, and, and for anyone who's wondering, does Tim program? I, I am not a programmer. But I did have, uh, as an aside, a very fun experience with Chad Fowler. He's not related to the Martin that you mentioned, is he? Nope. Okay. Nope. But I know Chad uh, quite well as well. And he's a, he was one of the early Ruby guys and really great guy. And he sat me down to walk me through, this was probably, this is after we first met at, at RailsConf. He sat me down to walk me through the basics of Ruby, comparing it to a language that he speaks, which is Hindi. And because I have some human natural language experience, he was able to sort of walk me through it doing that. And it's and it, it it made sense. I mean, the way he presented it. My question to you is, you uh, had talked about three days to be able to get it to talk, get something to talk to a database, right? And then four days, five days to know that you can build things. Is that a typical timeline? Or is that a uh, sort of a beautiful mind timeline for going from one language to another? Because if I think about, say, going from maybe je uh, Spanish to Portuguese, maybe, because it's they're very, very similar, right? But if you're going from Spanish to Japanese, you kind of start from scratch. And it would take a lot longer it, to get conversant in a new natural language. But how do programming languages work? Uh, and, and are you an anomaly in having picked up Ruby so quickly? I don't think I'm that much of a non because like natural languages, they're kind of families of languages. Mm -hmm. And so Latin languages or whatever, you can jump from one to another right. with with much greater ease than if you jump to a completely different family of languages like Japanese, for example. Right. So all from the get go, most of the concepts in programming tend to be there's this core set of concepts that once you understand conditionals and variables and so on and so forth, you kind of have a good baseline, right? It, it, perhaps that is kind of like learning Latin and then trying to learn other languages from there. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ruby really was interesting in the way that it wasn't, it didn't come up with a single new idea. And as far as I really know, what it did was it was like the, the master mixtape. It was the greatest hits of <laughs> all the programming languages that went before it, mixed together by the most amazing DJ you've ever heard. And you go like, oh, yeah, I recognize all the individual numbers here, but I've never heard them composed together like this. I've never heard like, oh, if you speed up the beat like this, so they just flow together. It's just it's a new experience. So I kept recognizing all these angles of it. Oh, this is kind of similar to that. But whoa, what a way they've chosen to express it. Um, so the onboarding was quite easy. And I think that that's one of the areas of real success that Ruby has had is that for a lot of programmers who've had some experience with programming, it instantly feels familiar. Right. The switching cost it, is really low. Yes. It's quite low to at least get started. I mean, to become an expert at anything still takes a long time. And I, I certainly have thoughts on unrealistic expectations that people have, especially these days about how long it takes to become an expert, but to get started and to get a hold of something and get a taste 
get a preview of what this could be. It was like getting sit down and then watch the world's greatest trailer. Mm-hmm. Like you're like, oh, in two minutes, I really want to see the rest of this movie. Like it's still going to take two and a half hours to watch the rest of the movie. But like just those two minutes was enough to get me fanatically excited about um, what was going on. And I think in terms of learning that new language, um, when you f- you see something that's uh, both the, the, the has some recognition and it also challenges you in some ways. I didn't certainly know all the concepts that uh, were mixed into Ruby, but I knew enough that it wasn't totally foreign. It wasn't a brand new concept. I didn't have to throw out everything that I knew to adopt it. I think that's where perhaps some other programming languages that were more radical, like uh, Lisp or even Smalltalk and the way those languages work, they were far more radical, right? Which is, in some ways is more pure. Ruby is not a very pure language. It's, uh, as I said, it's a DJ language. It's a <laughs> remix language. It's a mix-up of just all the greatest hits. Ruby didn't come up with very much original content in that sense. Um, but that's really a, how the world, at least that I operate in, works. That when you try to apply sort of that perfectly singular idea, it usually doesn't fit because mm-hmm. it doesn't doesn't bend, it doesn't stretch. Ruby really bends. Ruby really stretches such that it covers all sorts of different scenarios with just an elegance and a grace on the long timeline. You can take any one individual language and you say, oh, Lisp or small talk, and you can apply it to one problem that fits it really well. And you go like, okay, for that one problem, this probably is the best language in the world. It's just problem is a little, little narrow. And then if you try to apply that same best in the world idea to another problem, it becomes sometimes the worst ideal idea in the world, or it becomes just kind of awkward. Um, where with Ruby, it was just really, really good. Never perhaps the best in the world on any individual task, but so flexible, so uh, well remixed that it was just exceptionally good at a lot of different things. And I find that trait to be something that runs as a, a line through a lot of the things I get interested in. Um, with Basecamp, for example, the product that I built with, uh, with Ruby, we were never the best at any individual thing. Basecamp is, is a DJ remix of the best tools. Like, oh, we got chat, we got message boards, we got all these different things that then fit together and then it offers a solution, right? Not just like, I'm just going to be the best in the world, this one thing. Thought the same thing with Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails as a framework isn't the best in the world at any one thing, but it's a DJ remix master tape for like, oh, let's have a great evening and it's really going to fit well and it's, it's going to work out great. And to tie it to the racing we've been talking about, uh, I am, if I look at the strengths I have as a race car driver, they were never like qualifying. I could never put together the one perfect lap, in part because I kept having that damn dialogue running in my head of how I can improve things, which sometimes mean I step over the line and I actually regress. But where I was really good was long form endurance racing where I had to race in traffic, where I constantly had to deal with something new uh, and have to alter my line or vary things. That was when I got much closer to the peak of the racing community rather than just being singularly good in that one thing. And I've tried to apply that in my life in general. As in, I don't just have one thing that I'm really passionate or interested about. I'm not like, oh, it's all about work and I have to work on Basecamp 120 hours a week and it's all that. Nope. I like working on Basecamp. I like working on Ruby on Rails. I like driving a race car. I like spending time with the family. I've gotten into photography. I, there's a lot of things you can do. Well, not a lot of things. There's a sum of things you can do and then you can do those things really well. I think uh, 80-20 thing where I'd much rather have, you can get, 100% for 100% of the effort, right? Okay, fine. If you want to be the very, very, very best in the world, you have to spend 100% of you to get there. I just find that in- uninteresting. I'd rather have five things where I'm like in the top 80th percentile. Well, I want to underscore that because I think it's a really important point. And it's something that uh, a number of folks um, have spoken about with me. And it's it's a pattern, I think, worth highlighting for for those people listening. And that is if you want to, and Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert wrote about this uh, on his blog as I think it's just career advice. He said it, your options for achieving greatness, so to speak, are sort of 
number one and number two. Number one is trying to become the Michael Jordan of one specific domain. And that's extremely difficult. And your probabilities just don't look very good. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. But option number two is to combine unusual skills where you're in the top, like you said, the top, say, 20% or 15%. Then you become extremely valuable, right? And that can apply to racing. That can apply to not only people, but tools, like you mentioned, Basecamp, Ruby. Uh, and Mark Andreessen has also talked about this, uh, who's, who's uh, of course, created a, more than a handful of, of impressive things and has reinvented himself as an investor. But the uh, CEOs in this particular case, in his example, being combinations of, say, top 15, top 20% in a number of fields that might be viewed as disparate, right? So for, perhaps they have a physics degree undergrad than an MBA or a physics degree and then a law degree or whatever the combination might be, econ and computer science. Uh, quick thing, and it, there's a, what you said about Ruby made me think of gaming, actually, and I'm going to bastardize this, I'm sure, but the easy to learn, hard to master, and uh, I believe that's also Bushnell's Law um, from Atari, which was a good game, is easy to learn, hard to master. And um, Ruby itself, I had a question on what is, and I, I could look this up on Wikipedia, but since I have you <laughs> here, what or who is Ruby? And then why did you use the, the words on Rails? Yeah, so first I'd say that absolutely agree with that. Like that is the ideal, both for, for Basecamp and for Ruby and for Rails, all the things I'm working on, this notion that things should be welcoming. Like there are so many good ideas in the world that are good ideas, but require an immense amount of effort to penetrate. Lots of German philosophers come to mind where like there's some truly profound ideas about philosophy buried under an almost impenetrable description of them in right. non-human language form, right? Like it really has to be decoded by people to extract that wisdom. I find that to be just unnecessary. Like the best things, the things that I get really interested in, like they're approachable. You can get in into, say, programming Ruby or even driving a race car or any of these other things that I've gotten into photography. Um, they're, they're quite approachable and they've never been more approachable, but they're still really hard to, to get good at, right? And that's the fun part, that you're encouraged enough in the beginning to keep pulling on the thread. And then it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'd say that some of those domains that I I left behind that for me didn't do it for me, didn't pull all the tricks were like uh, I had working in PHP, for example. PHP is exceptionally approachable and even more so at the time, probably the most approachable of all the programming environments if you want to work on an information system. Just absolutely spectacular. It really aced that, right? Best in the world on that aspect of it. But then I found just, for me at the time, this is not a reflection because I know just the firestorm that's going to start otherwise, a uh, reflection of how things are. Let's just say that that's caveted to how things used to be. The threat wasn't that deep. Like, you, you, didn't, you couldn't pull for that long until you kind of felt like, okay, I, I reached the, the, the end of the bucket here. That was where it really inspired me with, with Ruby and, and to keep going with that. Was, you could just keep pulling and it would just it would keep getting better. Right. Like it already started out with this amazing trailer and like the movie just never stopped. Um, now I totally forgot the original question. <laughs> well, that's because my question was like a 17 parter. I asked you the uh, the at the very tail end, I asked about the origins of Ruby, like who or oh, yeah. what was it named after and then how you used on rails, why you used on sure, rails. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it's funny because it really ties there. There's so many of these trends that are overlapping and interlinked, even when they're applied at different scales and at different domains. The name Ruby itself is a kind of a remix, and so is Rails, actually. But let's take Ruby first. I know that uh, Matt, the Japanese creator of uh, Ruby, was inspired by Perl, um, mm. the language that went before it, uh, served as an inspiration. But even the name itself yeah, served as P an inspiration. P E R L, right? right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and he went like, oh, it's a short name. That's cool. It's kind of a precious, uh, I guess you'd say stone, even though I guess a pearl is not a stone, but it's a right. precious stone of some sort. Um, 
Is there another word like that that's also short, that's kind of in the same family, was kind of paying homage and uh, respect to the things that went before Ruby and where Ruby drew its inspiration? So Ruby was born, I think, in 95. Maybe uh, I seem to remember, maybe he even started working on it already in 93. But the first release, at least, I believe, was, uh, was 95. So it's been around for 21 years. And Matt's is still working on the language, which is just something else I truly admire respect and aspire to which is going to distance not just kicking off a ball and then running out of the room but sticking with it over the long long haul right like i've been working with uh base camp now for 12 years with ruby for 14 i mean you're looking at endeavors that like most of my adult experience have been with these uh, tools i've been even even race car driving now it's like on the one hand yeah i got started quickly and got going, but I've been going at it now for 10 years. It's still a, a key hobby and pursuit. I really like just digging deep and keep scratching, as we said, right? Like I just keep scratching, keep finding new things that are more interesting. Anyway, the same thing with um, with Rails. So uh, obviously we had Ruby, right? And I've been like, okay, let's, let's play off that. Let's pay some homage to that with an R. Like I, I want to have something that starts with an R too. And one of the inspirations at the time of Ruby was actually a Java web framework called Struts which in some ways was more of a negative inspiration, perhaps than a positive inspiration. It was like, oh, this is really interesting, like the concept of frameworks in general, but I really don't like how this is done. I really want to do basically <laughs> the opposite of what this is doing in a whole different lots of areas. But I find that's often just as valuable inspiration as the things you want to clone. It is just as Definitely. valuable to look at something and say, oh, that's what I don't want to do. That's what I don't want to be. I've learned perhaps more about running, a, say, a company from working at companies that did things that I thought were absolutely boneheaded, stupid, or whatever, than I learned from trying to emulate good companies. So in some domains, I think it's even more important to look at things that don't work and try to extract lessons from that rather than to look at things that do work. In any case, struts had kind of this construction feel to it, right? And I mean, like, oh, that's kind of cool. And I went, R, like, oh, Rails, like that's kind of similar. Like it has some fun plays on like, oh, you you kind of put your development on Rails that it kind of just goes, it's fast and so forth. And then I went to whatever site I was using to reserve domain names back then. I went rails.com, taken. Oh, damn, I can't get rails.com. Rails.org, nope, taken. Rails.net, nope, taken. <laughs> Rails. All sorts of other things, taken, 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 right? Like, all those singular words were already taken long since. And then I went like, oh, okay. I'm, well, I guess I need a domain name. Ruby on Rails then. Oh, free. Ruby on Rails.com. And, and there you go. So that's how it ended up with the name, not out of any other. I mean, I ended up actually liking it even better um, because it paid even more homage to Ruby. It was even more differential to it in the sense that Rails for me really is about introducing the rest of the world to Ruby. That that was that was the main mission. The Rails part was a vehicle to get people to discover what a wonderful programming language that Ruby is. So love that I could fit that as part of the name and that kind of became a became a thing. You mentioned learning from bad examples. Um, this can be applied to a lot of domains, of course, and I know people, in fact, who teach writing in uh, high schools or even colleges by having their students read examples of really bad writing because it's easier to identify what they don't like as opposed to figure out why the good writing works. Um, let's look at business. So you, you come to the US, you're working with Jason, and at the time 37 Signals, now Basecamp. What do you guys do differently? That's a broad question that uh, I'll try to answer in a meta way where is, by yeah. saying that one of the early inspirations for wanting to do this, wanting to work at my own company with Jason, where we would call the shots, was that we would get a chance to reevaluate everything from first principle. That I felt that there was so much of the mechanics of the businesses I had worked in before that was just mindlessly copied from, oh, that's that's just the way things are. That's just how we're doing things. Like, that's how other companies do things. Like, that's how you're supposed to do things. And I just saw enough of those misapplications or wrongful copies where I just went like, 
I don't think so. Like maybe this was a good idea somewhere at some time in some context, but it's lost all connection to goodness. And now it's just a really terrible idea. So when we're going to run our own company, we're going to evaluate everything from as much as we can from first principle. Everything from like how we hire, how we grow, how we do marketing, how we work on products, how we decide what we're going to work on. It's not that we can't be inspired by others, but let's just try to keep peeling back until we get to, to the first principle. Is this in first principle a good idea? Do you have any principles here at all? Right. Like a lot of people just clone techniques. They don't clone principles so they don't examine principles and they don't they aren't clear about what they want those principles to be be except if they're these overly broad oh we want to do good work for the work for the world or whatever meaningless things that anyone would agree to the only kinds of principles and direction that i care about are the things where reasonable people could disagree generally speaking i think that those are the interesting where points. reasonable points people of, can disagree could you elaborate on that yeah i think where where there's um where you're saying something that is meaningful because someone else would take the opposite side of it. Like if there's not an opposite side of this bet, I'm not saying something interesting. If I'm saying like people matters most, okay, who's going to disagree with that? Like it, basically anything that's on a corporate Fortune 500 motivational poster, poster <laughs> like you'd go like no one would say the opposite, right? And like you read right. these mission statements and you go like, yeah, you're not saying anything because you're not constraining your view you're not constraining the world and if you're not constraining the world like what are you doing why are you trying to draw this up well not, not yeah i was just going to say not not only that but in a way i mean you're acting as a scientist right and i think that good engineers and good programmers tend to have that lens through which they view things in so much as like if, if it's not a falsifiable hypothesis it's like it's just like what are you doing you're just uh kind exactly of, I think that has been one of the driving principles, at least for me. And sometimes we do argue about this internally, but the scientific method for me is just uh, just such a gold standard. It doesn't apply for everything in all cases always, but for me, it applies for most things most of the time. And if I cannot find ways where either what we're doing um, or what we believe has a falsifiable version of it, where it's say like, oh, well, what you believe actually didn't work, right? If we can't arrive at that conclusion, it's not an interesting thing to believe um, because then either anyone would believe it or it's not actually driving your actions. Because if if this principle can lead you to both sides of, of the coin, then it's not helping you make decisions. And that's really what I want. I want a framework to help me make decisions. And especially the tougher the call, the more interesting it is, because um, that's where we make progress. Uh, and that's always been what I've been interested in, in sort of refining Basecamp, the company, as being a product in itself that we could tweak and tune and optimize and make better for, for Jason and I owning the company, for all the employees that we have, and for all the customers that we have. And it's, it's again, it's, it's this system thinking that we're trying to improve the system and, and, and uh, optimize it in such a way that we do more good for more people more of the time. And if you're not measuring that, if you're not being scientific about it, you might stumble into it. Lots of people stumble into, quote unquote, a great company because they have just one idea, they have some luck or they have something else that just works. And then kind of the rest of it doesn't matter. Um, that's not so interesting to me. I, I mean, sure, we've had our fair share of luck. Of course we have. But I also think that the thing that keeps me going after all these years was not just like, oh, we got lucky once. It's the interesting part of, we keep scratching. How can the company be better this year than it was the, well, if you take it all the way to the origin of 37 signals 17 years ago. Um, and what's interesting in that too is that it's not just a straight line either, right? There are regressions. So it's been fascinating for me to go from the four people who built the first version of Basecamp to the 50 people who today run the company, which it's funny because I mean, most people would look at that like, oh, you're 50 people running Basecamp? Like that's a laughably small company. And to me, it's like this huge organization because my origins was, uh, and perhaps to some extent my preferences are a, a smaller thing put together really well. And do you, I, so I'm definitely gonna, gonna come back to the beauty and elegance or just beauty and elegance as concepts. But I wanna ask you first, since you brought it up, 
uh, and this was going to be one of my questions anyway, do you guys have a cap on the number of employees that you want to have at the company? In other words, base camp not to exceed X number of people, or is there any thinking along those lines? And if so, I, I think it's more a principle of, can, let's try to stay as small as we possibly can while still not feeling negligent about the things that we cannot do. Like, it's all good and well to say, oh, you're 50 people now. Like, what if we were 30 people and we just like didn't answer customers' emails? You can be a smaller company if you just don't want to respond to to feedback and you might still sell your product and so forth. But that seems negligent. So I want to be as small as is not negligent to be. And of course, like that, I mean, to some extent, perhaps that's a, not a scientific statement because how is that falsifiable? But there's just a sense that... Um, we can be much smaller than what the standard operating procedure is for a company of our number of customers, for the amount of work and output that we produce, for all the open source that we're involved with. We are definitely far, far smaller than the norm. Um, I see lots of companies, uh, many times our size, where I go, where is that effort going like i'm not seeing it's not visible maybe it's behind the scenes and it's always easy to compare yourself in flattering ways to stories where you don't know the full backstory but i think there's still something to be said from the idea of just trying to to optimize your company to be your best product mm -hmm. and if you do that then uh rejigging it and like i look at for example when i i write um code right like one of the chief principles of writing good code as it is about writing good prose is to remove needless words, remove needless paragraphs, remove needless complication. And for example, with, with companies, there's, let's just say policies, for example, um, lots of companies have all sorts of elaborate policies on, on spending on how you can justify, um, uh, expense reports and so on and so forth. Where we should, like, is there a way we can get away without that? Um, and one of the enduring policies we've had is when you get hired at base camp, you get a credit card and the policy is spend it wisely. The end. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and then, OK, forward your uh, receipts uh, if they're on email to this email address that we have that no one looks at. But just in case we get audited or something. And then that's not a perfect solution. It doesn't track every expense to the ninth degree. And if we do get audited, there might be some discrepancies where Things don't line up 100% and you deal with it then mm -hmm. compared to what you sort of just save in overhead and complexity of. And it's not just about this thing. That's just one small thing. But imagine making that choice on 100 things. All of a sudden, the amount of complexity you get rid of just compounds and the whole thing ends up being so much easier, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at companies and you look at company growth, if you're uh, four people and you hire uh, four more people, um, maybe you get close to 100% improvement in productivity, but probably not. Probably more like 50% or whatever, right? If you're already 50 people and you hire another 20 people, are you getting like another 50% again? Absolutely not. You're getting what, 5%, 7%? Like the complexity curve is not linear. When you uh, make your company more complex, either through people or processes or policies. Um, the marginal benefit to sort of the overall thing you're trying to accomplish just drops really quickly. Um, so that's one of the things that I've just on a personal level has been interested in. Like, how can we maintain maximum efficiency? And to some extent, and in some situations, that's gone too far. Like, I've been pursuing maximum efficiency sometimes beyond the point of what's reasonable you could say like when in the beginning when we had zero money at all and we had to be just four people and so forth we had to be maximum efficient because we didn't have anyone else's money to spend we had to spend our own revenue so we could only grow accordingly to that but now we're at a different place so now perhaps you can afford a little bit of slack and i'm i appreciate that idea again i appreciate generally ideas that sort of stretch and bend and a maximum of efficiency at all times does not stretch and bend that much. But having that at least as some sort of platonic ideal, um, something you always have at the back of your mind and something you try to drive decisions from still leaves you 
to a very different place than where we would have been if we had gone the standard route of, oh, here's a new software company with a product that's taking off. Let's get a lot of venture capital money invested. Let's hire a bunch of people. Let's staff up to 100 as quickly as we can. Let's just start blowing it out right away. That's the standard model, and lots of people have followed that, and some have succeeded, and lots and lots and lots of others have gone up in spectacular flame. And I just looked at the situation and went, what am I trying to do here? What am I trying to do with Basecamp? Why Basecamp? Well, first of all, I'd like to set up a company that I would want to work at in 20 years. Like I actually, uh, to be honest, I don't like learning tons of new people all the time. Like I'm an introvert. I like working with people for the long term because you get to get to know them and you get comfortable with them. You fall into a groove where things are just so much easier and you need to say so much less to get the same amount of work done. And there's just a reliance and a trust in that competency. And if I want to do that, if, then I can't install all sorts of time bombs in my business. I can't install like, okay, if I take X amount of money from these people, then they want it back in seven years and they want a 10 X. So we have to swing for the fences to get that. Otherwise we're going to blow up. Well, so that's one thing, right? Like I want a stable long-term work environment because that's just where I find that I can get access to these flow states as much as possible. And that's, what's a lot of fun and, and so forth. Then secondly, um, I want to do this because I want some modicum of success. Like I don't need to be a billionaire. I don't need to be even a hundreds millionaire. I just need to be uh, comfortable in knowing that like, okay, we, we got to some baseline, right? Like I like to compare the fact that the difference between having zero dollars and a million dollars is extremely large in terms of sort of basic comforts of, of living. The difference between having a million dollars and two million dollars, vanishingly small on the same scale, right? And the further up the chain you go, the less marginal benefit there is, at least within my hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Yes, if your biggest dream in the world is to own the New York Jets, as uh, Gary Vee wants to do, or you want to send people to Mars like uh, Elon Musk or any of those kind of wild dreams, okay, fine, you need billions of dollars. And, and you should pursue strategies that are compatible with that. I perhaps have more, it sounds funny, but modest. It's only in comparison to those outliers, modest ideas of it. So I want to optimize my chances for that. So part of that was like, I want to optimize my chances when I'm running a business of how can I just become like a millionaire, like just a basic run of the mill millionaire, which is still like, you look at the world stage, like incredibly rare thing, right? And an extremely blessed uh, position to be in, but still infinite, well, not infinitely, far, far, far more likely than to become the next billionaire, right? Like the number of millionaires in the world versus the number of billionaires in the world. Like that's actually been one of the things that's been driving a lot of how I approach, where do I want to be? Like if you should take, where do you want to be in programming? Where do you want to be in racing? Where do you want to do in business? I'm like, I. it's such an oxymoron, but I feel like I modestly just want to be in the top 5%, right? Like I don't need to be, again, as we talked about, I don't need to put in 100% to, to be Michael Jordan. I don't need, because it's even worse than that, right? Like, and that's the reason I don't want to do it. I don't want to put in 100% to have a really, really poor chance of becoming Michael Jordan. So I don't Michael Jordan. Lots and lots and lots of other people who, if you just take the baseball or basketball metaphor, that are good base, basketball players, right? And can make a good living and get to play in the NBA. And like, that's pretty amazing, right? I just want to make it to the NBA. I don't have to be Michael Jordan. <laughs> no, definitely. And I want to just emphasize something that uh, I think I think you said. I mean, this is how I think about it or have been trying to think about it more and more in the last, say, five years is that you have to or you should strive to have compatible goals right? in the sense that a lot of the folks I meet, and I live in San Francisco, I live right in the, the belly of the beast. And uh, you run into folks who maybe they have hundreds of millions of dollars and they are completely miserable. And when you really dig into it, if you have the chance to do it over wine or whatnot, very often you find that they have incompatible goals. In other words, like what they need to feel fulfilled and calm or in flow is not compatible with the other ambitious, say, business or financial goals that they have. So it's doomed to fail, right? I mean, if you succeed and you accomplish all of your goals, <laughs> if they're incompatible, 
you're basically just sowing the seeds of your own destruction. And so I wanted to ask you, do you consider yourself a happy person? Yes. You do. Absolutely. And part of it is because I work at that. Like that is 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 one of the explicit goals of higher tribe to die the decision. Is this gonna make me a happier person? Um Jeff Bezos has sort of the reverse of it, which is his regret minimization framework, which sounds like just something Jeff Bezos would come up with, where he's like, I'm just going to try to drive my life in such a way that I have the least regrets. I don't know if that's the path that I'm taking, but ha happiness is also sort of a fuzzy term, right? Like one of the things I know that you've been interested in, too, and, and has really spoken to me is um, stoicism and this notion of tranquility, to be in this state of contentment and tranquility it's happiness have some sort of like connotations as though i'm running around all the time laughing my ass off I'm like, oh, <laughs> isn't this wonderful life <laughs> right like that's not i don't aspire to that that's not how most days are but i do have a sense of deep <laughs> tranquility and contentment with the situation that uh, i'm in and part of that is actually Going all the way back to the beginning, my key takeaway from the four hour work week was the concept of lifestyle design. Mm -hmm. That there's so many people who just follow, who are on rails in the negative sense of the word of like how things are supposed to go. Okay, first I get my this education. I perhaps don't even really care that much for the subject, but it'll lead to a good job. Then I'll get the good job. Then I'll get married. Then I'll like da 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 da. And then at 65, I'll retire. And then I can really live life. What? Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, good chance you won't make it to 65. And then everything was wasted between uh, getting born and not getting there. Um, second of all, why would you waste or wait until the worst decades of your life in terms of physical mobility and, and capabilities otherwise to start enjoying life? And that's the problem I really have with a lot of the startup ethos and work spirit in general in the US and in Silicon Valley in particular, this notion like let's compress working life. If you could just like work like a madman or a mad woman for 120 hours a week for like seven years straight, then Nirvana will be waiting on the other side and you can <laughs> take all your millions in winnings and you can sit down on a deserted island somewhere and drink a mojito. And you're like do you know what? I know people who've gone exactly through that. And after two weeks on the beach, they went like, wait, what? Wasn't this supposed to be winning? This is miserable. I hate it. I don't want to be here. Like that was not actually my destination. The thing I gave up all sorts of valuable things to arrive at is a miserable place to be. And I don't want to. It's easy to trivialize these things, especially easy when you actually already are a millionaire to trivialize um, sort of the struggles and, and the aspirations of, of someone where money can make a big difference. But when you're talking about people who already made it and want to make it more, right? It's incredible how often the people end up sucked into this notion that like, oh, if I just make it to the next step, then I'm going to be happy. Then happiness awaits me. When just a false treadmill. It, not only is it a hedonic treadmill in that it keeps moving further and further away from you, but it's also just false. It really does not pay out that way. The, as we've talked about a bunch on this show already, flow, the striving, the getting better, like that's where living is. That's where happiness is. And it can happen whether you're at the beginning or at your end of that journey. Like I think back of when someone asked me, are you happy? I think back of when I sat in Copenhagen in 2001 in my what, 350 square, meet, or, uh, square feet apartment, tiny, tiny little apartment in Copenhagen. I was going to school at the time. I was learning uh, PHP. I had all sorts of things I was worried about, like rent and so on, not on an existential level, but still in, in a normal sense of it, right? Also, it's also think, I'm still happy. I was mm -hmm. within margins of where things are today. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those two situations, otherwise from a level of possessions or quote unquote success, like they're pretty different <laughs> places mm -hmm. to be. And yet they don't feel that different. And part of that is to have that focus on the inner journey, on the inner strive of this, uh, 
Another quote I, I love just pulling out whenever context fits or not is uh, Coco Chanel, the best things in life are free and the next best things are very expensive. <laughs> and I like that because it sort of, it recognizes that the next best things are still pretty great. It's just that there's so many of the very best things that you can focus on that whatever is on the next best thing and which does happen to be very expensive, it's just so far down the ladder that uh, once you adopt the philosophy of life that allows you to view it from that angle, it really puts things into perspective. It gets it so much easier to get to tranquility. And I, I think that uh, tranquility is, in a lot of respects, a better goal than happiness, which has been, the, the word is so overused to have become almost meaningless. I wanted to use it just because it's a, it's a more straightforward term and more familiar term, but it's it seems to me also that if we're talking about, say, flow states, if we're talking about tranquility, uh, it relates to developing an internal locus of control or an internal a metric is probably too quantitative a term, uh, view of progress. So you're competing against yourself as opposed to, in some positional economic sense, competing against the Joneses, right? Which you're never going to win because there's always going to be a, another Jones <laughs> who's willing to sacrifice more than you are if um, if you're kind of chasing, as you said, this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The, the uh, All of which relates to Stoicism, but I wanted to uh, also reiterate one thing that you mentioned, which is this seven to 10 year sprint that you see so often in Silicon Valley. And the misconception that you can then automatically just park up and sit on a beach and uh you know praise uh, praise god here's nirvana the the disconnect i think for a lot of folks or the question that they'd be well served to ask is am i develop am i developing attributes now that i can use in multiple states in multiple endeavors right because what people fail to realize is that if you are going to stand a snowball's chance in hell of actually creating the next unicorn or whatever it might be and cashing out in seven to 10 years, the work habits and so on that you're going to have to develop are completely incompatible with sitting on that beach yes. and being happy. Yes. On, yes. Com- diametrically opposed. And you and just automatically switching those gears is not as easy as one might think. In fact, it's exceptionally difficult. You have to completely reprogram yourself. So coming back to the stoicism, and you mentioned Jeff Bezos, I've uh, been reading some of your articles, and uh, there was one line that jumped out at me is really profound and applicable in a lot of contexts. And I think this is from the, the day I became a millionaire post. And it is expectations, not outcomes govern the happiness of your perceived reality. And uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that but also talk about, because I, I genuinely don't know the answer to this, why, how did you navigate the decision to take money from Jeff Bezos in 2006? Yep. Let me start with the, with the first thing. Um, I keep having to relearn this lesson very often, and I feel like this is one of the lessons I've practiced the most. But as most of the most profound, important lessons in life, you can't just read the text and then internalize it. It takes practice time and time again. And this notion that it's the expectations, not the outcomes themselves, that's what matters, is really about looking inwards and seeing like whether something is good or bad in a lot of cases, not all cases, but in many of the challenges we face, whether something is good or bad, that's just you deciding that. And it it doesn't happen by random. It happens because it flows through your habits and it happens because it's flows through your expectations. If I take one example, just um, I got we've talked a bunch about racing in my 2013 season, we had a stellar season. We finished second in the championship and we finished second at the 24 hours of Le Mans. Like absolutely amazing, right? It was probably one of the worst years I've had in racing. It was absolutely miserable on all sorts of levels. And one of the, the key reason why it was miserable was exactly because of this expectation. We came in from the get go with a lineup, a backing, a car that said, this is supposed to be the front runner. These guys are supposed to win. And then when we didn't win, finishing second didn't feel like finishing second. It felt like being a complete loser. Right. And what was funny was just just the year before, 2012, right? I started, this was my first year at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And I was thrilled just to finish the race. 
it was wonderful, right? Like one of the magic experiences of all the time I've been in racing was to finish the race in 2012. I don't know what we finished, seventh, eighth. I don't even care. That wasn't the expectation. That wasn't the goal, right? And then already the year after, somehow I got suckered into expectations that said, you're supposed to win. And when we didn't win, it felt like a ton of bricks on us. And I've had this over and over again. Whenever I feel like I've personally done a good job at the racetrack, it's all about my internal competition. It's not about where we end up finishing up. Some of the best races I've ever had, we finished last. Some of the worst races I've ever had, we finished first. They're all about whether I felt like I progressed and I did everything in the best way I could possibly do, whether I disappointed myself. And disappointment is intrinsically linked to expectation. Um, so being extremely careful about how you set your expectations, I think, is probably the number one key to tranquility for me. And there's a lot of uh, stoic writing that addresses this point directly. And, and one of the things that I, I love around expectations is, and stoicism is this notion of negative visualization. Oh, my favorite. Yeah. Arguably the most valuable thing that I've taken from stoicism. Yeah. You, you imagine all these terrible things that can happen, right? To, to set the context and set your expectations in a completely different light. That I, every day probably, at least every week, I imagine what would happen if I went broke, if I had a major accident where I would lose some of my limbs, if all sorts of terrible things would happen to either my family or to my professional life or to the world at large. And then I process that and A, try to come to terms with, with those things uh, and B, use it as a driver to be sort of thankful for the things I have without becoming attached to them. And playing those mental games, I think that's the number one thing. Like happiness, not happiness, uh, in state of tranquility, not in state of tranquility, they're all about the mental games that you play. To a large degree, I'm not. I mean, obviously, there are some places in the world where it's a lot harder to be happy and in a state of tranquility than in other places. But if we're talking about Western developed uh, worlds where you're not living on the edge of poverty, then I'd say the mental game is uh, is almost all of it. Um, and then in terms of sort of the mechanics, so in in 2006, um, I had already been exposed long enough to the internet industry and to the venture capital world to realize that's not what we wanted to do, that that was an incompatible goal to take a bunch of money from venture capitals with all the strings that that implies and getting the other things that we wanted, like running a company for 20 years, like calling the shots ourselves, like not having to go and sell our company or go IPO or being forced into some unsustainable or devious tactics for growth, or any of all these other pressures that come from taking other people's money and trying to fuel them in as rocket fuel for your company. So what ended up happening was uh, Jason and I looked at our sort of risk and we said like, okay, right now, 37 Signals Base Camp, like there's something. We have some traction, as people like to call it, right? There's <laughs> traction, that's valuable. There are people who want to give us millions of dollars to put into the company in hopes that we can turn this company into being worth a hundred million or a billion or whatever else that they're trying to get out of it. Right. So we could do that and then we could take some money off the table or we could try to just swing for those fences to, to try to get that. Um, or we could try to see if we can find someone where in, instead of investing in the company, as in taking money and putting them into the company to use that money for growth, which is what VCs do. Um, we could perhaps find someone to, make a hedge, hedge bet with us, where we could sell a small, non-control, no strings attached portion of the ownership that Jason and I each have, and then just pocket that money. Not put any of it into the company, not accept any of the strings that would normally go with a venture capital contract, not accept any of the timeline, not start any of the time bombs or any of the other stuff that goes on. Just say like, hey, Jeff, if you want to be along for the ride, uh, we'll sell you a small slice of each of our share and simply take the money and use it as our hedge. Just that if this base camp thing goes poof um, and turns into the next French or whatever, <laughs> then at least we've taken something off the table uh, such that we don't have 100% of the risk in just one basket 
I'm a big believer in diversification and all sorts of manners and endeavors, as we've talked about. I've tried to diversify my interests such that should the terrible thing happen, as I frequently negatively visualize that base camp collapses, like I'm it was my whole identity wrapped up in that. I can go off to other things and and be fine, right? So we took a, a little bit off the table, and that's where that post, I Became a Millionaire, came from. Um, and it's funny because even I felt like I was pretty well prepared for all of that stuff, and I was still deceived by what happened afterwards in the sense that uh, I think it's almost impossible in our sort of civilization today to not be infected by the constant propaganda for like what happens when you get quote unquote rich that like milk is flowing and honey in the streets and like certain things are wonderful and it's a fine threat to or needle to thread especially once you made it to the other side to say like oh yeah it doesn't matter that much and tons of people will actually say yeah okay i didn't eat today um so tell me again what it is about doesn't matter right so that to me doesn't mean you can't talk about the topic it isn't interesting and and i talk about it anyway uh and the conclusion I basically came to was that even knowing all the things that I thought I knew, like my expectations were still too high. I still thought that it was going to have a bigger dent on my life than it ended up doing, right? And it only reaffirmed my belief that where happiness comes from, where tranquility comes from, are not those places, that the very best things in life indeed are free. Uh, and this, And I got to taste some of the second best things, and that was a lot of fun too. But at the end of the day, they were much more transient. And the things I've kept on doing, I still program Ruby almost every day. Like a, a day is better, generally speaking, when I get to program Ruby, because that's just what I truly enjoy doing. And if you look at lots of people who've made it very well, they still continue to do what it. Like we talked about Jeff Bezos. How long has he been running Amazon now? Like 20 plus years, right? Plus years, yeah. Like he doesn't need to. He could retire to a beach somewhere and sit there and do that. He doesn't want to do that, right? Like none of the people, like uh, um, everyone from Steve Jobs to like all the sort of standard list of heroes you can go through. Like most people just stick to the things that provide them flow and interesting new challenges and the striving that defines life and the purpose of it. And if you realize that, you can prioritize that first. Mm -hmm. And you can prioritize other things below that. And I think that that's a really helpful way to guide your decisions. For us, it helped guide the decision that we didn't want to do that venture capital time bomb because it was completely incompatible with these other goals that we had and aspirations for life. And now I've got to play that out a bit, right? Like Basecamp would either have IPO'd or be sold or whatever. Now, if we had taken that money back in 2006, we we're well past the deadline of, um, of when the money would be up. And I'm sitting here on the other side and saying, like, you know what? It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. The other side is pretty good. It's not as spectacular. It's not as glamorous. Perhaps there's not as much crystal champagne or private jets or whatever. But you know what? It's pretty good. And I get to do mo more of the things uh, more of the time uh, than I would otherwise. Like, I talk to lots of entrepreneurs all the time who either ended up with what they thought was success, right? Like they sold their company, then they did the beach thing for three weeks. And then they ended up even worse off than that, right? They realized that the beach thing was not where tranquility was hidden. They came back and now they're like, oh, what am I supposed to do now? Oh, I guess start another company. And oftentimes the second time around is not as good. It's not either as good of an idea or it's hard to do it again. You've lost something really valuable that's hard to get back. And I see a lot of people at that other side, like worse off than they were when they were just that tiny startup, two people struggling um, to make things work, but striving in flow, in tranquility. Yeah, it's, it's extremely common. And I think what I've at least tried to apply for myself is practice. Like you, if you want to be good and you hope to enjoy all of these things by using your time for fun when you have money, you have to practice that before you have yes. <laughs> yes. money. And it sounds ridiculous, but I, th I think that money is like alcohol in the sense that it just makes you more of who you already are. So <laughs> it's not like somebody who becomes a huge asshole when they're drunk has no amount of asshole in them when they're sober. They just keep it under wraps. And 
money applies the same type of pressure to the vessel, right? And so it's going to amplify your strengths, your weaknesses, your neuroses. And so you have to practice the skills or the the use of time, for instance, that you want to have when you have this influx of pressure. And uh, I was going to mention, because you uh, were discussing negative visualization, I highly recommend, and this is in public domain, anybody can read it, there is a letter by Seneca the Younger. Well, he has a compilation of letters called The Moral Letters to Lucilius, L-U-C-I-L-I-U-S. And there's a very specific letter, letter 18, probably takes 10 minutes to read, but it's called On Festivals and Fasting. And it talks about not just negative visualization, but uh, fear rehearsal, effectively, where you set aside a few days each month to say, I'm making these up, but sleep on the floor in a sleeping bag in your kitchen for a few nights or eat nothing but rice and beans or instant oatmeal for a few days, wear the same pair of jeans, whatever it might be, simulating the condition that you fear. In other words, if you lost everything or if you had to take a pay cut because you needed six months to figure out your next gig because you hate your current gig, whatever it might be, by removing that fear, uh, it emboldens you to do something that, uh, do many different things, uh, including, you know, one thing that you and Jason are very well known for, which is being outspoken, right? I mean, you can't do that if you're constantly in fear of having the rug pulled out from under you. Um, the, uh, on Bezos, just one last point on that. What is he, what does he get out of investing in Basecamp? Is it that he hopes at some point you guys will have a change of heart and look for, or at least entertain a liquidity event or an acquisition? So if you take Basecamp or Bezos first, he got his money back and then some, and he still owns a part of the company. We paid him back. Like uh, one of the wonderful it. things of, of having a private company that's profitable is that you get profits. Like money actually comes out of the equation, which I know is a, almost a foreign dirty word in <laughs> Silicon Valley. Like, wait, what? There's money coming out of the company? You're supposed to be in the red. Like what's going on here? Um, but that's what happened. Like we've run a profitable company for 17 years. Like things compound and like what's not a big payday in year one, like if you do that 10 years in a row, like that's, that's money. That's real money. And, and he's been paid back. He's uh, more than made whole and he continues to earn his share of the profits every Got year. It. And I, I mean, of course, these are rounding errors, like the freaking dollar moves one cent and he has lost more money in like two hours than he would ever gain or lose on, um, on our investment. So I don't think he actually does it that much for the money. Mm -hmm. I think the money is just a extension of simply him having fun with this, having fun with the investments and so on. So it's not perhaps as pure economical as, as someone like a, a VC who's investing other people's money, a fund in something and has to show certain things. I think Bezos has made a ton of investments in, in people simply because he enjoyed doing that and enjoyed seeing it. And, and he enjoyed uh, our sort of irreverent take on a lot of things and, and kind of wanted to support that. And, uh, and again, the, it was pocket change to him to, to do it. Right. Have you met him in person? Yeah, we've spent quite a, especially in the early years, um, a fair amount of time with him. Usually we would meet up with him about once a year and spend a good amount of time with him. And I always learned a bunch. And the funny thing is, of course, that, one of the reasons I learned the button was that he wasn't just a version of Jason and I. He was, in many ways, the direct opposite, right? Like the way right. he runs Amazon um, as a public company is like 180 degrees the opposite of how we do things, which is, I think, why part of the attraction, right? Like that he wasn't just looking for little minions that were trying to do the same thing as him. He was looking for people who could challenge his thinking. And we've certainly had our thinking challenged by him as well. Um, so I think that that's, it's, it's great to have those kind of, associations in your life where it's not just like, oh, someone does exactly the same thing that I do, but better, but someone does something totally different than me. And I can learn something really important from, uh, from that perspective. But I'd say too, on, as you mentioned with, uh, with habits, that that has been one of the things I've been incredibly conscious about that I've seen people just be trapped by their habits. Most people are right. Like that's how we want run our lives. So we've been extremely conscientious about getting the right habits. Uh, not just for ourselves, which for both Jason and I have meant like, hey, let's just work 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. right? 
like not try to do the 80 thing or the 120 thing just because we're bootstrapping or whatever else it is. We want to set habits that we can comfortably want to have on the other side as well and do that for our company as well and do that even for the product. One of the things we worked on for the new version of Basecamp was this notion that work can wait, that I think in this age of uh, mobile phones and apps and so on, engagement has become this magic excuse for interrupting people all the time. And yeah, 100%, 100% people. agreed. Well, it's also a, it's a vanity metric that, yes. that, that venture back startups can use to Jedi mind trick their investors into convincing them that something is happening <laughs> that's, me- that's meaningful when nothing meaningful is happening. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's one of the things that we've been freed from, right? Like we don't have to maintain any vanity metrics. Basecamp can actually be a better product both for us and for our customers if it doesn't have as much engagement. If people can get the things that they need out of it when they need out of it, and then Basecamp can kind of go away. So, for example, for Basecamp 3, we have this feature called Work Can Wait. You click it on and Basecamp won't send you any notifications, won't send you any emails, won't bother you in any way once you're off the clock. By default, it's set to nine to five. But then after that, and on weekends, if you have someone in your company, which in a company of 50, you usually do that, like sends an email on Saturday or whatever, you're not interrupting everyone. You're not broadcasting and blasting everyone all the time. Um, and I, I, that's been one of the things that's been near and dear to me. And I think in the US, people kind of laugh that off as silly. Like, wait, what? Like, um, can't you just like figure out how to manage your own life and so on? No, I think these habits matter. I think if you look at the French, which also the reason to laugh at the French, but this is not one of them in my opinion. There was a proposal in their parliament uh, last year, I believe it was, where they said like employees should have the right to disconnect, that they ha- should have the right not to receive emails that their boss expects them to answer on Saturdays. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a truth with some modification. There are always disasters and whatever that can happen. Most of the time, they don't. Most of the time, your boss just sends you an email on something stupid on Saturday that is kind of implied that you have to deal with, even though it's not that important. There's just such an ASAP culture um, all over the world, but in the U.S. in particular, where everyone thinks that it's their right to have access to everyone else immediately all the time. And I think that's just incredibly corrosive. And I think in some ways, it's just getting worse, right? Like, Mobile phones is one thing. The rise of chat applications in the workplace is another. Um, there's a lot of new pressures uh, bombarding us with interruptions all the time. And if there's one thing I've found is tranquility and flow is not compatible with interruptions. No. If your day is chopped up and into tiny work moments of 40 minutes here and an hour and 20 there, you will get nothing interesting done. You can get routine work done. You can't get interesting creative work done. The only time I make progress of any material kind on anything that has ended up mattering really on the creative side of the company has been when I've had large stretches of uninterrupted time. That means no chat. It means no phone buzzing. It means none of these interruptions. You just need two, three, four hours to really sink your teeth in, scratch deep enough on the problem where you can really truly understand it and then make progress on it. And we've just made it almost impossibly hard these days. And in many ways, we're making it harder and harder. Like the number of unread counters that most apps ship with, the default settings for blasting everyone all the time, the new expectation that you have to hang out in a chat room and respond to every meme within two minutes is terrible. It's just absurd in many ways, which, by the way, is another great book on philosophy in the current age that I'm, I'm reading right now, uh, Michael Foley, The Age of Absurdity, that draws on a lot of these uh, <laughs> things we've talked about, Stoicism included, and on this current uh, and accelerating culture of just constant interruption and quote-unquote multitasking, which it really isn't. It's task switching. Um, I think it's just terrible. And we got to do something to push back. No, I agree. Uh, and I think it has to start uh, at a personal level, right? Making decisions like you have in creating these blocks of time. Do you schedule those on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis? How do you create that time or how do you schedule it? I try to have it every day. I, I get that question from people all the time where they like, oh, how do you get so much done? And I look at them sometimes in bewilderment and I go like, I don't actually feel like I'm getting that much done. <laughs> I just happen to configure my life and my business in such a way that I, most of the time, I have long, uninterrupted stretches of time 
Mm-hmm. And when you every day can get like a three hour block or whatever, um, you just get a lot of stuff done and yeah. it doesn't feel like it. What feels uh, well, it doesn't I, feel rushed. It, right? it, it looks impossible when if your day is this kind of standard corporate day where your your day is just chopped up into these tiny moments. Uh, you're exhausted at the end of the day and you're like you feel like you didn't get a good day's work and you can look at someone else and like. How did they get all that done? How did they create and maintain Ruby on Rails? How did they keep Basecamp running with the uh, millions of people that they have using it with that few people on board? How did they do all these things? And we go like, I at least go oftentimes. Uh, I don't know what we're looking at. We can't be looking at the same thing. It doesn't feel stressful to me. I work 40 hours or less sometimes in the summer when we do Friday's office. We used to call it. Now we just call it the four-day work week uh, during the summer. We work like 32 hours a week and we still get a bunch of stuff done. So it's absolutely possible. It's how you configure and squeeze out the quality of time, not the amount of time. It's not about being eight hours in an office. It's about increasing the quality of the hours that you spend. Um, and most people just produce really crappy quality, really shitty hours. They have eight of them, but they're completely soiled and spoiled. Versus if uh, you just have four of them that are in pristine, great condition, you'll run laps around the person who sits with four or eight shitty hours. This is, this is part of the reason why I almost never agree to let journalists uh, follow me for any piece because it would be so boring. And the reason I bring it up is that people might have this image of me like it's kind of like, extreme snowboarding meets girls gone wild meets i don't know rock climbing like 24 7 and the reality is i feel like i spend most of my time staring off into space but i i do block out i try to block out the first three to four hours of each day for completely non-reactive activities right and that's it and and i was thinking about this yesterday in fact because i had a day yesterday where i was like i got to the end of the day and i was like i don't really think i got anything done today it doesn't particularly bother me but i was just observing it and i thought to myself well, I, the good news is if I have those blocks of time, and this may sound odd, but it's like if I have those uninterrupted blocks of time and, this is important, I'm focusing on the one or two force multipliers, right? The one or two things that are really going to make everything else easier or irrelevant. I only really need two days a week where I get yes. my shit yes. done properly and yes. it creates the illusion of having done a ton of other things because I'm hitting the right dominoes in the right orders. I have that feeling all the time. I have days all the time where I feel like, really, there wasn't that much in this day. But I look at it on a timeline of like two weeks, and I often go like, oh, wow, I'm very happy with that. (laughs) (laughs) I look at a timeline of, for example, what we got done at the company in a year. Like we just, we released the Basecamp 3, an all new version of the software last year, a year ago, right? And Jason just wrote up a summary of all the things we've worked on this year. And I go like, wait a minute, that's actually incredible. Like, how did we get all that stuff done when each individual week or each individual day, generally speaking, they're not like frantic, crazy death march rushes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But it's just a compound nature of good habits, compound nature of tranquility, compound nature of sustained, sustainable progress. It's the same thing as we talked about with the business, right? We have never had a hockey stick business. Basecamp has never been a hockey stick business. It's just been a linear growth business. And if you keep drawing that line out long enough, that's still good. <laughs> linear growth is still pretty damn good if you can just keep drawing long enough. Well, it, it comes looks- down to your expectations line, right? Yes. I mean, it's and because you say expectations, not outcomes, govern the happiness. Uh, but it also governs uh, a lot more than that. I mean, if, if you, the timeline with... Th- uh, through which, as a lens, you look at your progress is really important, right? Because if if you are making like a lot of venture backed startups, I mean, look, I'm I'm a player and I have been historically a player in that game, so I'm not going to totally slam every aspect of it. But it, there are quite that's a few, why I'm here. Yeah, th- that's why you're here. And there there are, <laughs> but there are some like g- mass delusional activities that go on in that world, and one of them is being so focused on the short term that you basically just 
commit suicide over the long term. And you can do that even if you're a one man show or a one woman show, right? If you're not looking at the two weeks, you're looking at each day. And as a result, you commit to being busy instead of actually taking the time to prioritize, which requires that slack, that empty space of having three to four hours in many cases. I wanted to uh, ask you about another piece of yours. Uh, and the inspiration for it, because the, I, I don't think the backstory is in there. And it's called It's Always Your Fault, which is, <laughs> I think ties into stoicism pretty well in, in a lot of respects. Uh, and it brought to mind a question that I was asked once by a gentleman named Jerry Colonna, who's a coach at, of sorts at this point. I mean, he does a lot more than that, but he was a uh, previously very successful investor, among other things. And one of the questions he likes to ask is, how are you complicit in creating the conditions you say you don't want, right? So this this taking of accountability, what inspired, maybe you can give a sort of a synopsis of the piece, it's always your fault, but also I want to know the inspiration. Like, why did that, why did you write that? Was What prompted that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think one of the uh, things I've always tried to do, and we talked about this in multiple domains, is to look at situations as systems, as feedback loops. And it's always your fault is recognizing that you're part of all systems. All well, it's kind of like a truism, right? Like you're part of all the systems you're part of. So at Basecamp, for example, I am in some way part of everything that goes on. Whether I'm involved in a project or not involved in the project, I set up some of the outlines. I set up some of the frameworks. I helped create some of the culture that led to what happened. Um, it's one of the things I keep trying to hammer into race teams as well. Uh, race teams, a lot of times, they they love these things of like, oh yeah, just happened. I mean, you, I mean, it's just a bad luck, right? That's what people say, bad luck. And sometimes you have bad luck, and bad luck generally means like. There's a very low percent chance of something going wrong, and it went wrong anyway. That's at least, I think, a fair definition of bad luck. A lot of people use bad luck as there was a great chance of this going wrong, and it went wrong, and that sucks. <laughs> you know what? That's not bad luck. That is bad, bad planning. System, that, bad <laughs> planning, bad design, bad all sorts of things. That's your fault. And if you just write it off as bad luck, you're in the short term, escaping some pain of accepting your complicity, as you said, in the outcomes, but you're also not learning anything. And if you're not learning anything, how are you going to make anything better? How are you going to prevent the quote unquote bad luck from happening next time? That is just one of the things I cannot take. I cannot stand for. Like I am all about, we make mistakes and that happens. But when I make the same mistake twice, that is one of the most painful experiences that uh, I go through. And that has happened uh, enough in both in company and, and personal life where I just like, wait a minute, this situation seems familiar. How did I get myself into this? Do you know what? This is my fault. This is my fault for putting myself into this situation. It's my fault for reinforcing the dynamics of this situation. It's my fault for enabling this situation. Even when it's not technically my fault, like let's say something breaks on the car because someone didn't set up in, in the right way. That's not, I mean, I didn't do it, right? Like I didn't swing that wrench, but it's my fault for, let's say, uh, getting on a team that doesn't have the budget that they need to have to do this to not emphasizing the value and insisting on the stability of the team or of the people who are on the team, uh, not doing enough work on debriefs and so postmodems of trying to figure out what's the root cause of our problems. It's always my fault. There's always some complicity in any situation where I feel like, oh, that bad luck affected me. My fault. And it's just so much more actionable. That's one of the things that I like. I like things that are actionable, where I can actually do something, change something, act in a different way, where now I'm better. We're better. We've learned something. We moved forward, right? And we will make new mistakes. And as long as they are novel, that's fine. Just let's not make the same mistakes over and over again. I cannot stand repeating myself. I remember in the days before... Uh, version control before Git and CVS and subversions and so on, I would sometimes overwrite my files, right? Mm. I would have spent four hours in a piece of code and then I would make a mistake and I would delete the file. Like, 
I knew of nothing worse than having to redo that work. It was so physically painful to me that I can remember several features of both Basecamp and earlier systems I worked on where I had a ver- working feature and I somehow killed it and I just never made it again. <laughs> I simply could not stand to redo the work again. So that has carried over and it's just even amplified with mistakes because mistakes are just extra painful, right? Like and these mistakes, especially as as a, a company uh, size of Basecamp, like I'm not just responsible for my own mistake, I'm responsible for everyone else's mistake. And I need to learn every single time that happens and change the system, change the dynamic, change the flow of the feedback loop, change the inputs, change the configuration of how things are installed in such a way that it's not like, oh, let's prevent this from ever happening again, because I think that often leads you down a path of an overreaction. Yeah. But still just considering the whole system, considering you're part of it, not writing things up to bad luck. I mean, you hear that a lot in racing. I don't hear that a lot in the, at Basecamp. And, and I think perhaps in part just because every single time someone have brought that up, I've a weakness kind of perhaps lost my cool a little bit on that, <laughs> which in itself is a failure that you should learn from and correct from and, and so forth. Uh, it's certainly not bad luck, but yeah, I just, I can't take it. And we got to accept that responsibility and we got to do it all. Uh, the closer you are to the system, for example, um, like I tweet a fair amount about politics and I tweet mostly about U.S. politics. Why do I tweet about U.S. politics and not about the politics of, I don't know, Iran or uh, Georgia or Russia or something else? Well, partly because I've paid millions in taxes. So I kind of have a vested interest in like this particular country. I happen to live here. I happen to have a direct line of influence to some extent at least even though i'm not granted the right to uh to vote uh i still feel like (laughs) this is the closest area where i have complicity Mm -hmm. i have complicity in these actions and i have uh, some chance of kind of affecting that it's so much easier to just call shit out when there when there's no personal complicity right like it's for sure the the speck in your neighbor's eye and and all that stuff so yeah do you think you're impatience uh well i shouldn't say impatience your uh distaste <laughs> for repeating work is part of what made you a good programmer absolutely i think it, it's almost pathological actually uh, that i have such an aversion to doing the same thing twice that i mean not that it's that unique. I think that lots of programmers have it that I'll sometimes go overboard and just trying to prevent that from happening again. And that's where I need some restraint of saying like, okay, I've only seen this problem once. Uh, I might fear that I'll see it again, but until I actually see it again, let's, let's not uh, overreact here <laughs> and build some huge honking framework to, to do it again. But I usually match one of the things I like the most actually in terms of working on open source and on Ruby on Rails has been pattern matching in the work that I already do. So it's not so much that the thing is exactly the same, but there's a pattern, there's an outline that's similar. And when I spot those similar outlines uh, and I come up with an extraction that kind of makes that work go away next time that something has a similar shape and outline, that is really where I hit the jackpot in terms of personal satisfaction with the work. I love just spotting these things where I think to myself, hey, if I had to write Basecamp again from scratch tomorrow, I'd be so much better off because I'd solve all these problems. I'd put all these tools into the toolkit of, of Basecamp. And I, this is one of the things with negative visualization where I have this, I don't know, nightmare or fantasy, however you want to put it, where like we lose it all, right? I have to do it all over again from scratch. We have to write Basecam again. It's just me and Jason and whatever. And like, we don't have the 50 people anymore. We don't have all the money and like, whatever, like, where am I? Can I do it? Right? Like I imagine this whole thing and I've packed this backpack. I gave a, a talk at the RailsCon, I think last year about the survival kit that Rails is for me. I, I think of like, if everything goes wrong and I have to start over from scratch, will I at least have the tools to survive? And that's my mission for Rails and it's always been. Like if I had to reboot fully, I don't have a staff, I don't have other programmers, I don't have anything, I just have myself. Self-sufficiency, as we talked about at the beginning, has been a just such an important driver to the pathological level. And I mean, <laughs> good things have come out of it and, and sometimes not so good things come out of it too. I think it's it's, there are good things to think about, like how can you rely on and depend on other people. But hey, uh, I carry that cross and and deal with that and, and just try to maximize the benefits and minimize the, the drawbacks of it. But one of the benefits have been just this focus on 
creating truly productive tools that allow tiny teams to do amazing things. Because I want to enable other people who want to do it like we did it, tiny team, no external money, to have a chance to compete. Yeah. Because it didn't used to be that way, right? If you wanted to start a web startup in 95 or whatever, and you had to spend 200 grand on an Oracle license just to get a database going, like that was a terrible time to get things going. Now it's never been easier. And I, I just love that. And, I mean, yeah. it's funny. We're lowering the barriers of entry, which in some sense makes it perhaps harder because there's more people competing. But it, to me, it's just there's something fairer about that. And I can imagine myself in that situation. I can imagine myself rebooting, doing all the negative visualization and thinking, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. No, it, I mean, I've used Basecamp for the last three book launches and I'm going to be doing so again shortly in about uh, a month and a half. And uh, I'm asked all the time, how many people do you have on your team? And I'm like, ah, one, maybe two really full-time employees. And then the rest are all contracted and everyone's distributed. Uh, so it's, it has, I think it's never been easier from the standpoint of having a low barrier to entry. And I find that encouraging because A, if you're not competing, you're not getting better. You should have some type of competition in your life, some type of pressure to improve. And second, uh, it gives you the opportunity to compete in a game that you can rig in a sense, because like we were talking about earlier, if you are in the top 20th, uh, you know, like the top decile or even quartile in two or three areas, you can find a way to differentiate yourself. Whereas previously, if the cost entry was mediated primarily by finances, like if you don't have the money, you're fucked. You know, like <laughs> so if you don't have 500 grand to start, you know, to, to, to buy or rent the infrastructure you need for that tech startup, like you do not pass go. That's it. You don't have a chance to use those other abilities. Um, but I could go, go on and on. I, I wanted to, uh, you mentioned the age of absurdity. Do you have any other favorite philosophers or writers? Um, oh, a lot. Uh, but I'll, let's draw on some of the influence we talked about. In terms of stoicism, I think what really just got me turned on to that originally was uh, sort of an introductory text that summarizes a lot of the work, which is uh, The Guide to a Good Life. Yeah, yeah, that's um, uh, Irvine, right? William Yep, Irvine. which is... Um, not source material, and, and perhaps if I'd knew, known how approachable the source material was, either Seneca or Aurelius, then you can you can also go straight to that. But I just found it a very easy, easy again, one of those things, as, as we talked about with what we like, like uh, easy to learn, hard to master. Yeah. I found uh, the Guide to Good Life, the introductory text, was just a, an easy way to learn about it and recognize why this resonates. And then I kept pulling on the thread and, and kept reading from there. Um, let's see what else. Um, one of the things we haven't talked so much about is, is I became a parent, uh, four years ago or so. So yep. now I have two boys and I've tried to treat that as a system too, to some extent of like, how can I become better at simply being a parent and being there for, for the two kids that we have. And, um, the work of Alfie Cohen, uh, he has a bunch of really good books. Uh, the one that got me started was Punished by Rewards, mm. which is actually a book all about motivation and how rewards basically don't work in most cases for developing uh, kids or encouraging creative work. Or It kind of tackles both everything from students to works to kids. Um, there's also a great book called The Myth of the Spoiled Child. Um, which is even more specific about um, nurturing and supporting kids and so forth. Uh, that's been very inspirational. That has then led to, I, I just read uh, Daniel Pink's uh, book, Drive, which takes some of those same ideas about motivation and rewards and extrapolate them in a kind of a little bit of, I mean, I like the book, but kind of an obnoxious language of businessy, like everything is right. business 2.0. This, that, and the other thing, uh, which is a little grating, but the core concepts and points are really strong and very influential for how we try to to run the business. Uh, which I'm kind of going just free association here. The um, other book is called uh, "Turn the Ship Around," which is a wonderful book about uh, a guy, uh, uh, naval, what do you call it? Not commander, but uh, admiral. admiral or something that was running one of the worst performing U.S. nuclear submarines. And turned it around to be the best performing U.S. submarine by 
infusing his staff with basically saying like they're not waiting for a command they're saying what they intend to do um it ties into many of the same topics but it's very actionable and very approachable i really like that and we try to use that as aspiration for how we drive projects motivation and cultivate this idea of manager of one at base camp where people are sort of individually both responsible and capable for doing the work and aren't waiting around to get permission. Um, that's been, that's been great. Um, another, uh, sort of just to fly all over the map. Um, once I got interested in, in reading more about philosophy, I also got more interested in reading about sort of, um, political science and the development of, uh, countries and authorities and so forth. There's a, fantastic uh, two-part books called uh, Origins of Political Order by Fukuyama, I think is his name, and the um, something about political decay, which traces back sort of nation states all the way back to uh, 4,000 years BC and goes through all the case studies of uh, the rise of China and and so forth. And it's just a really interesting way of putting current events into a larger perspective. I think sometimes it's easy to freak out about things like the current election or whatever. And like, oh, we're in a completely unique time frame and like all these challenges and so forth are, are un- new and unique. And, and no, they're not. Right. Like right. history, uh, if not repeats and rhymes. And if you know the pattern, then it's both easier to cope. Because you go like, this is not a unique punishment on me that we live through these times. Uh, people grappled with the same issues 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, since pretty much the dawn of civilization. Um, but it also gives you some idea of seeing the arc of time and seeing trends and seeing which way things point. And I think that's been uh, very helpful. Um, so I really like that. And as a parent, just to return to that, because quite a few people asked about this. Are there particular ways that you quantify or assess whether you are being a good father or parent? Uh, And or are there mistakes you think that are very common among parents aside from the over-rewarding? Maybe they Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I try to be quite direct like uh my oldest son is now almost four years old and since he was at least two he could actually tell me what he liked and he didn't like and i know that that sounds like an overly permissive thing oh you just have this kid commanding your parents around but i think that's a stereotype a cutout board that people use to excuse just forcing their will on little people who can't really do anything about it Mm -hmm. and that's one of the main things that i've sort of try to just constantly put me myself in the shoes of my four-year-old boy, right? Okay, if I was in his shoes right now with his pressures and so on, what would I think would be a reasonable course of action? And of course, it's not a perfect uh, transplantation, but I found that a lot of people, I don't know, they, they have a lot of, lo- I mean, all, all functional parents love their kids, right? But that doesn't mean they always have empathy with their kids. And it certainly doesn't mean that they always act on that empathy for their kids. I think there's a lot of, it's not helicopter parenting thing. It's it's overprotecting and things that are convenient for the parent. That, oh, uh, it'd actually be great for me right now if you did these things. And then I'll couch it in right. language and justification as, oh, I'm doing what's best for you. And right, I'll rationalize the, exactly, conven- right? the convenience for myself. Yes. And like, oh, it's best for me right now if you do what I say. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's best for you. Um, that doesn't mean that's best for the kid. And the other thing, uh, I, trend that I've been sort of just alarmed about is this notion of basically criminalizing independence. And especially in the U.S., um, this war on kids basically being by themselves or doing anything that even looks remotely dangerous that we've been at such a Someone could get hurt, which, by the way, is a topic of another good book um, on this topic of of parenting and and letting kids um, kind of free roam a little more. Um, I think that we all have these romanticized versions of, oh, when I grew up, everything was wonderful and blah, 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 which I don't ascribe to that. And I don't ascribe to like, oh, everything is terrible now just because like I'm older and whatever. Right. But 
I think there is a sense, at least coming from Denmark, that um, letting kids run risks and letting kids hurt themselves and letting kids learn the things they need to learn through personal experience, I think is so much more effective than trying to be a t- parent that tells your kids what's right for them. So just take one simple example. Sometimes like your kid doesn't want to eat the things that they're supposed to eat, right? Like they just want to eat candy all day. Well, you can tell them if you eat all that candy, you're going to get a stomach ache, right? Or, well, you can say that and then you can yank the candy away from the kid and the kid just goes like, you're an asshole, right? You just used force to deprive me of this thing I wanted. Or you can just fucking let your kid eat the bag of candy and get a tummy ache and learn on their own accord that, okay, the next bag of candy, maybe they'll eat that too. Maybe they'll eat the bag of candy after that too. You know what? After the third time, I found, uh, well, sample size two, <laughs> direct exposure and sample size somewhat larger and indirect exposure. But at least in my experience and observation of these things, like kids aren't that stupid. And they take experiences that they have and they internalize lessons from them. And they do it a whole lot better if you don't try to do the pre-processing for them. If you don't try to basically chew their food for them and say like, oh, this is going to happen if you do that and then prevent them from doing that. Like that's not a very persuasive technique. Um, So I've tried to perhaps to sometimes an extreme degree to say like, hey, by the way, this is my assessment of the situation. I think this is what's going to happen. Like one thing that a lot of people have been freaking out about, screen time, right? You can't have your kid get an iPad and just sit on it for as long as they want because like then they're just going to be addicted to that and they're going to sit on that eight hours a day. I don't. First of all, I found that to be categorically untrue with my sample size. Um, but I've also found it to be an unpersuasive argument in the grand scheme of things. I, I liken it to the article or the experiment of cocaine right remember that famous experiment where they would have cocaine in a bottle for a rat mm-hmm. and sort of the rat would just go over and eat cocaine until the rat died and everyone went like see that's what happens like if anyone tastes cocaine they'll just eat cocaine until they die scientific proof then i think in 2005 someone replicated a version of that experience experiment where they had an outlet of cocaine and then the rat or the mouse had a bunch of other activities too there were other mice around. They could go in the wheel. They could drink water. They could do all sorts of other things, right? Guess what? That mouse didn't just eat cocaine until it died, right? Like oftentimes, uh, if you think like, oh, my kid would just sit on the couch eight hours a day and just do the iPad, perhaps your alternatives suck. <laughs> You're not providing perhaps ample, uh, parent, rich environment. You just yeah. want to engage. Perhaps you don't want to reach your kids. Perhaps you don't want to take them anywhere. Perhaps you then just want to enforce this idyllic version of what you think. Oh, they should just play with wooden blocks all day. And like, that's really good for them. You know what? Fuck you. I I mean, (laughs) it's just, I find it so lacking in basic understanding and compassion of like, what would you want to do in that situation? And what then perhaps more interesting is that I've tried to then say like, there's, there's not really a limit on uh, iPad use. If, uh, Colt wants to be on the iPad for eight hours in a day, he'll binge for eight hours. And that has happened, right? Like that has happened one or two times, like gets really into a game or a show or something else and really binges on it. What happens the next day? He doesn't want anything to do with that iPad. Because you know what? Kids are pretty good at self-regulating. Again, sample size too. Um, in my experience that if you have other interesting things and choices and opportunities that they can choose to partake in, they will. Mm-hmm. And this mania of like oh ipads are the new devil it's just i just find it hilarious there's a good um, twitter account i forget what's called something about like uh terrors from the past or something where we go like they pull out old newspaper clippings and go like in 1895 people were like books are really terrible if people just sit all day and read books then they'll get trapped in their own mind and then it was like <laughs> comic books are terrible or dungeons and dragons is terrible and Eh, okay like there, at least there's a pattern of history here where people decrying new technologies or new forms of entertainments that kids choose to partake in as terrible they haven't panned out that well um so perhaps there's a history there to be informed by and perhaps you don't need to freak the fuck out over the fact that your kid just binges a bit on an ipad like how can you say anything like didn't you just netflix binge the last time you had a babysitter and <laughs> thought that was a good time so <laughs> yeah there's a uh, hysteria never goes out of style uh the um, 
question of habits. So you mentioned a few things, uh, empathy being one of them. Uh, I'll give you yet another two part question because I seem to be, uh, for whatever reason, too much too much caffeine maybe on the on the two part thread today. But uh, first is uh, there are a fair number of people who describe you as angry, and so part one is do you think of yourself? Do you think you're an angry person? Second is what are the habits that have helped you to develop empathy? With your uh, children specifically, yeah. maybe. Yep. I think angry is, um, is a funny word to me because like, even when I'm going off, like, I generally don't feel angry. In the, sometimes I do. I, I, let's be fair here. Sometimes I do feel that. But a lot of the times I think it comes off like that where that's not the inner mental state, the inner dialogue that's going in my head, right? Like I'm just just processing these things, for example, uh, and going through like, hey, this isn't right, or I think this is, well, that's a version of the same thing, this is wrong or whatever. And I'm trying to process this and I'm trying to set up and decompose the system. And as I'm decomposing the system of what is it that led to this, um, I get pretty fired up. But angry to me has this sort of residue effect where someone's just walking around with a grimace on their face and or they're shouting or whatever, which oftentimes when I write perhaps the most indignant tweets, like none of the sorts is going on. Um, so I think it, it's one of those things where uh, I forget what the novel was, but there's this concept of what you see in a person on the outside is, is often not the reflection of what's going on in their inner life. Sure. Uh, and it's a valuable lesson to compare your own um, outward profile sometimes uh, and how you, other people see you to, to how you see yourself. And like perhaps sometimes if there's a great disconnect, you should change somewhat on one end or the other. But perhaps more so it should teach you some empathy for other people and the fact that they probably live the same experience, right? That mm -hmm. um, there's a difference between the inner and the outer of the life. But another part of it too is sometimes things are just a release for me too. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I don't have like things I walk around with a lot of anxiety about. I try to discharge sort of negative energy or whatever. And sometimes perhaps I should just shout into a pillow. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately this invention of things like Twitter and so on is, is, has become a pillow for, um, for, for a lot of people, including me at times. And, when did, when did you, when, when did you Twitter? sign up for Twitter? Yeah, I, Do you uh, know? I actually it's funny because I totally didn't get Twitter when it got started. I got um, on the first beta because uh, they were using Ruby and Rails and I knew some of the people who worked on the very first version and they invited me to it. And back then it was like an SMS thing mainly. Sure, I, like, I remember. Yeah. I don't understand this. Like what my friends are supposed to say where they're going and so on. So anyway, I didn't get it for like the first two years and I, I didn't really get into it until what is it, 09 or whenever it was that uh, a little while after it got launched. Um, but then I totally got addicted to it, of course, right? Because first, it is this pillow. And <laughs> it, what's, what's funny is sometimes it's, that's therapeutic, right? The, the, <laughs> yeah. have the pillow just for yourself, even if no one was listening. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, now I have like, I don't know. Um, Millions of pillows. <laughs> I, I have quite a few people who, who find that interesting. And I can understand that because I listen to other pe people's pillows too. And some of my favorite accounts are other people's pillows where they're just screaming into it. And sometimes like it's just anger. And for the best accounts, it, of course, it's more than just anger. It's insightful commentary on things that should be better, right? Yeah. Like, on, like, let's not make the same mistakes again, or let's analyze the system and, and so on and so forth. So I absolutely adore Twitter in terms of personal therapy and, and the, the way it allows me to watch the therapy of others. Um, <laughs> well, I was so, just thinking that you, maybe I should change my Twitter bio to, you know, screaming into the pillow since 2009. Yes. Uh, yes. And if you don't follow Patton Oswalt, uh, he is a, he's a comedian and brilliant Twitter account. I mean, very insightful commentary, but hilarious at the same time. Lots of screaming into the pillow stuff. Very, very high caliber. <laughs> Right. I wish I, I I could add that spice to the mix that I was also really funny because sometimes <laughs> it is just loud voices into the pillow. And what, that's not always pleasant to listen to. And I know, for example, Jason uh, Freed, my, my business partner, for quite a long time, he disconnected from Twitter. And I can totally understand that. I can totally understand that 
certain people have a disposition where listening to people shout into pillows all day long is not a great way for them to spend their time. I don't know why, but it doesn't affect me in that negative way. Like I can watch a lot of pretty negative shit going on, but if I feel like there's kernels of truth and and there's there's insight in that, uh, it doesn't it doesn't transport like I don't sit in and steam and get really angry angry and ruin my night over it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's at least pretty rare, I'd say. What uh, uh, j- just to jump to the habits uh, yeah. because it's I think a lot of parents have the best of intentions. They read books. They have maybe they even have some great first principles, but it doesn't make it doesn't cross the chasm from an abstract sentence in their head to regular practice. How do you do that? So I think perhaps one of the best practices we have is just about winding down for for the evening and then always ending up like I often put Colt to sleep now and Jamie, my wife, will put um, Dash, our younger boy, to sleep. And I just get to spend like, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours from like dinner through reading books, through taking a bath or whatever at night. And It's really a lovely ritual to have just those tasks. Okay, we'll fight a little over, not even fight. I'll try all sorts of rational arguments for why he should brush his teeth and they'll all fail. (laughs) And then I'll come up with some funny story of like why we need to brush teeth on the whale or something. And then all of a sudden, like brushing teeth is the greatest thing ever. Um, (laughs) That was just a replay from last night. (laughs) Or like we'll read the same books again or or whatever. And just having that... um, consistency in that pattern of it is, is just uh, really nice. And I think on top of that, um, the privilege of working from home affords me things like um, I, I take him to school most mornings. And yeah, that means I start a little later. And so what? Then I work a little later too. And it also means I'm here when he comes home from school and so forth. It's just, uh, I feel like I'm very mindful of um, thinking of things like life is long enough Not life is too short, because I think that's when you're living it wrong. Life is long enough. And if I pay attention, if I do my negative visualization, and if I truly make the hours count with Colt, with Dash, with the family, then I'll be happy when it's over. Because I I do negative visualization on that all the time. Like I have a fantastic time right now where I have an almost four-year-old who really enjoys spending time with me. Uh, at least most of the time when he doesn't call me a stupid idiot or doesn't want to see me again, <laughs> which usually, hopefully, thankfully, doesn't last that long at the time, but of course lasts or happens all the time too. But I also look and think like in 10 years, that, that just won't be true. There's just, there's no version of reality, well, healthy version of reality where, where that happens in the same way when he's 14. Like then he's, that's over, right? So I will make sure that the next, 10 years or whatever, where we go through this period where, where that isn't true. And we have this kind of relationship that we have now, um, which is sort of very high intensity and many hours and so on, that's going to count. And I'll be happy on the other side. And then I can enjoy the other part of it, right? Then when he becomes a, uh, a teenager and, and yells at me perhaps even more and in even more pointed ways, um, I can appreciate that too, right? Someone finding their independence and, and so forth. And that could be a chapter, and I can appreciate that too. Because I look back on, I just turned 37, um, and I look back on my 30s, or better part of that is done, and my 20s are certainly long gone. And I look back at those periods and think, like, I got the most out of that. Mm-hmm. Well, not the most, because it's not an optimization. I got good out of that. I do not, there are no regrets here. I don't regret just spending my 20s just locked in a room working on some piece of software all the time because that's not how it happened, right? Like I set up in such a way that I can live through my 20s, my 30s, hopefully then my 40s and my 50s and whatever. And then I can come and arrive and be 85 or 90 and say, I lived a good life. And it, it's okay that that's at the end. And that's it. That's what we're here for. When uh, I'm going to... I'm going to jump into if you have the time I'd love to go through some some rapid fire questions. Sure, they sure. don't they don't have to be rapid fire answers at all. But when you think of the word successful or hear the word successful, who's the first person who comes to mind and why or who comes to mind? Um a bunch of or names that come to mind. One that's kind of trite is my 
is my mom. Um, and the reason I say that is she has such an upbeat, happy outlook. On, like she is the perfect unknowing stoic. She's actually a Catholic, but I think she's exceptionally good at many stoic principles of uh, tranquility and so on and, and dealing with sort of adversity of life in a way where like she's incredibly happy with very first order principles, like the best things in life and doesn't care at all about the second best things in life. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely an inspiration. But I, I met many other people along the way um, who aren't successful in any meaningful objective term from the outside of someone looking at either the job they have or uh, the money that they make or the house they live in or the clothes they wear, or any other things of that kind. And they just have a, a an inner life, a mental life that where I just go like, whoa, I'm jealous. Like, I feel like I'm doing pretty good on that scale. And, and I've certainly met people, uh, friends where I'd still go like, you're really rocking it, aren't you? Um, when you mean, when you say internal I, life, what I've do you mean by seen. that? Is it, I, I mean that they, they, they have that sense of tranquility, right? I They've see, arrived okay. at a point of like, wow, you have an amazing amount of tranquility and, calm in your life given the fact that in in some cases like you face some real adversities right and it's just impressive to me and i mean that doesn't it's not to say that that doesn't happen on the other end too that someone who does have outward success um can also have that i've just found that there's very, there's all, basically no correlation that i found yeah like, no i agree have the yeah. best most tranquil inner lives and contentness like there's no correlation to where they are in that outward status some of them are some of them are have made all sorts of money and whatever and some of them have made none of the sort and some of them have made a little of it and everything in between and i've been able to find no correlation there so i'm, I'm still sort of searching for what that is but at least for me uh, getting conscious about that fact and uh, being diligent about having a ph uh, philosophy of life having a framework and working on these things I mean, that has made a difference to me. Um, so maybe that's also, I mean, I should probably inquire more about this because I find it endlessly fascinating, especially since you can't find that statistically correlation like, oh, it's this one thing that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's all inside the head. Is there um, anyone who, to counterbalance the critiques that you've had of, say, Silicon Valley and the venture back startup game, is there anyone in the business world you would really like to spend, you really respect and would like to spend more time with or just spend time with? You're like, you know what? That person is either fascinating or doing it right, seems to be doing it right. I want to spend more time or learn from that person. Good question. Um, one of the early business idols that I have that I'd still love to meet, I heard he just mentioned Basecamp in something unrelated, um, which made me all sort of fanboy flutter was um, Ricardo Semler. Oh, yeah, from Semco in yep. Brazil. He wrote a fantastic book uh, called Maverick that um, was a great inspiration to to me and I know to Jason as well. And To me, to me as well. <laughs> giving the confidence of like, Jesus, if this guy with 8,000 employees running a industrial company producing pumps for oil tanks can be this radical and this uh, incisive about how to design a company, like surely we as a software company with no fixed assets in the 21st century can be just a little more radical than what we think is possible. Right. <laughs> so I think that that, uh, yeah, Ricardo Semler is definitely, um, high on that list. Um, who else? Um, in terms of a larger than life persona, I've always had sort of a soft spot for Richard Branson. Um, I know that like, it's hard to know like what's actually caricature and myth and whatever, once you get at that level, but, um, absolutely fascinating character. Um, Warren Buffett, I know we're kind of sort of just going through a highlight reel. That's kind of just easy. Like, Oh yeah. I wish I'd also sat down with Steve jobs when he was live. Okay. Well, yeah. You started with a Hickard assembler. I bet a lot yeah, of people listening I don't know who so. he is. So, um, but yeah, I think those are, um, those are some of the characters that, that I'd love to meet. But the thing is what I found in, in a number of cases where 
and I'm sure this goes for me too on the episode. And like when you meet your heroes, then sometimes it's better just to have the idealized version. Yeah, like I the, agree. That I you agree. took away when you read their book or saw their talks or listened to their podcast or did anything else like that. Uh, I've at least found that um, it's a, been a rare moment where I've met someone and where it then exceeded that and went above that. Well, I, I would say that A, that's true. And B, I used to think that was because they were flawed in some way that because I would f- meet the heroes with clay feet, as they say, right? And then I realized, I, I thought maybe it was because they're flawed in some way that wasn't uh, portrayed or wasn't reflected in how they portray themselves. And then I realized, you know what? It actually relates to your point about expectations and why you were unhappy coming in second place, which is silly in retrospect, but you came into it or most people come into it, let's say having read a book or listened to a podcast, which is really the highlight reel (laughs) of that person. So then you meet them and you're like, wait a second, I thought all 90 minutes was going to be like the fucking 60 second trailer. What is this bullshit? And then you're like, oh, wait, it's a human being too. And uh, exactly. uh, And it's, you know, I think about this sometimes when it's like, I'll have, I had this guy come up to me. This happens surprisingly often, which is part of the reason why I stopped investing in startups. But where I'll, I'll be like in a bathroom at an airport and some like 22 year old startup founder will come up and start like breathing on my neck, pitching a startup right behind my head. And I, and I clearly not the best time. Uh, it could be the most right. amazing pitch <laughs> mankind has ever heard. Not the best time. And, ha- and on top of that, I'm probably running to a flight. So I'm like, you know what? I'd love to talk, but number one, you're breathing on my neck and making me uncomfortable. Number two, I have to run to my flight and I kind of, run off and they're like wow tim ferris is such a dick i had no idea and like forever that experience will have contaminated whatever uh view they might have had of me um so yes i mean i think there's always a risk in meeting your heroes Um, and i I think it's exactly that point that uh, someone who reads rework or whatever we get a fair amount of email uh often very flattering right and and that it's, it's really great it's great that someone read sort of the, the highlight reel of 10 years of thinking, right? And then sometimes I get the qual- follow-up question of like, oh, can you then tell me like, what's the one thing you'd like for like a startup founder to do or something? I'm like, dude, you just read my highlight reel. You think like I'm on the spot going to come up with something brilliant? Like it, that's just not <laughs> how material works, right? Like it's like walking up to a comedian, like, hey, say something funny. <laughs> right, right, right. It's just like, you, you can't just walk up to someone and like, Oh, be brilliant, please. Can you be brilliant for me for like 30 seconds on command right here? Like most people just, most brilliant people aren't brilliant most of the time, right? It yeah. takes a long time to to develop the material and develop the thinking and so forth. And when they put it out, like that's it. Like that that's the best stuff. The yeah. best stuff isn't hidden somewhere else. I guarantee you, if I had a ton of other super brilliant things sitting in the back of my head, I publish them, right? <laughs> like they aren't just sitting there waiting. Oh, they're just waiting for this guy to write me and say, like, "Hey, do you have something brilliant to say about this one specific thing?" And so I get how people sometimes write me, and, and I'll write back, and like, I'm sure they're disappointed, right? Because it wasn't brilliant. All they saw was this condensed little version of it. Uh, and I think about it in the same ways that the, like startup or um, comedians they go on the club circuit and they work for years to come up with enough to fill an HBO special, right? Like, all the stuff in between just wasn't funny, dude. Like they developed, I don't know, 30 minutes of material and they probably spent 300 or 3000 hours of shitty material to get there. Oh, no yeah. one has killer shots all the time. That's uh, part of the reason I love to go to, I, I enjoy stand-up comedy, but I love to go to small venues where well-known comedians are working on their material because you see half of it bomb and they have a little notebook yes. and they take notes yes. on it. And I love watching that. If, it, if people listening have never seen that process, uh, there is a documentary called Comedian that tracks Jerry Seinfeld and another up-and-comer as they are working the circuit and as Jerry's working on new material. And you see Seinfeld bomb. I mean, crickets. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's reassuring and I also think realistic to check that out and it informs a lot of other areas. Uh, speaking of documentaries, do you have any favorite documentaries or movies? Ah, let's see. Um, 
I like the big short. Uh, I had read the book already. Um, that was a good one. Um, let's see what else. Um, I just saw what was it called? A montage of heck about the uh, Nirvana guy, um, which was interesting too. I the funny thing is with kids, I don't know what it is. There's like a cutoff at about an hour where like we can devour TV shows no problem because they fit within the hour and like that's good. But like a movie that's two hours often feels like, oh, that's impossible. Like we'd have to get like <laughs> have to get a babysitter. Like it's got to be on a Saturday. Like it's got to be this special thing yep. because it's not that often that you get like the two hour stretch to fit into your life versus the the TV show like of one hour like fits perfectly for me, which is why when it comes to nonfiction stuff, um, I love catching sort of, again, the highlight reels like Bill Maher and his new rules segment, mm -hmm. I find to be some of the most. He's wrong on a lot of things, as most people are. And I mean, he's very right on a lot of things, which is then when you disagree with him, makes it feel like he's so, that much more wrong on the things that he's <laughs> you're disagreeing with him, which happens with a lot of people. I'm sure lots of people. I get this all the time on, on tweets. I get these backhanded compliments like I usually think that DHH is an idiot. But like, hey, this one thing was really great, like without realizing that. You know what? Like, there's a lot of people who kind of have that emotion about just different topics, right? So maybe like no one is just that brilliant all the time. And if they say something you find really spot on and excite insightful, when they talk about another topic where you aren't in agreement, like it's going to sting just as hard the other way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was that was a good answer. I, f I find more that more than documentaries what i sometimes get a little i get a little impatient with documentaries because i kind of find like the point they're trying to make mm -hmm. could be made in like 10 minutes right and we're stretching it to an hour and 45 with pictures and unless those pictures are amazing um there's a lot of other things i'd rather do i'd rather watch game of thrones and then spend the other 45 minutes reading a book where i feel like the compression of ideas and uh, condensation of content is greater that was one of the inspirations uh for when we wrote rework that every idea should be expressed preferably in one page and if it had to two and like i think there's only a handful that's three pages because i hate reading business books and watching documentaries where you're like okay i got the point Right. right. This, like, this is a 15 minute TED talk that was bloated yes. into 400 pages. Exactly. Right. And I have that problem too. Sometimes I'm sure some of my own content where I uh, go up on stage and like, Hey, I have 20 minutes of content, but my slot is 45. <laughs> Shit. Uh, all right. Let's just jam it pack of memes and funny pictures and, and try to make some jokes. Uh, I think there's a lot of really important things to know and learn that just, they are as long as they are. And, and that's it. Like we got some negative feedback on we work something like, oh, I really love all these ideas. And like the person would rattle off like, I don't know how many ideas. Right. And they'd say, but the book is really too short. <laughs> and like, wait a minute. Um, most business books, I, I list like one, two or three things that really stick. Uh, and they're like 400 pages. And you just rattled off 12 things in, and we got it to you in like two and a half hours. Like, how is that not a win? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what. I think the key there is to respond with, well, you realize the important point is not just ingesting the information. <laughs> you have to actually do something with that. But uh, what books have you gifted most to other people if you've gifted books? Hmm. I haven't gifted a lot of books. I've made a lot of recommendations for books. But uh, part of it perhaps is that I don't really buy physical books anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I'm all Kindle all the time. I love Kindle. And right. then on top of that, I'm all um, Audible. Right. Like, so I've been traveling a fair bit since I started racing internationally. And that sometimes includes driving for long periods of time, not on the track, but to and from destinations. And I find Audible is just a wonderful way to read books without reading them, like getting the information of the books while you do so. That's how I'm, I'm that um, Fukuyama book, The Origins of Political Order, 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> of so, audiobook, so, right? So if you wanted to get somebody hooked on audiobooks, which audiobooks might you suggest to them? Uh, the one I'm listening to right now, uh, The Age of Absurdity, is really good. Uh, not just because I think it's a, it's a great book and funny. 
it's also because the narrator just is perfect. I, I can just imagine sort of this crotchety old guy sitting in his rocking chair, just rattling off um, sort of curmudgeon ideas, which is exactly what this book is. But <laughs> that's also just really funny. And I, uh, I like that a lot. And then for if you do have sort of the stamina of, sort of a major tone that origins of political order book i thought was uh was pretty great some other books like for example the the drive book i i got that on audible as well didn't love that as much um it's it's funny how much the narrator can really taint or lift up material um and obviously that's that's a personal preference but that's why before i get anything on audible i always even if i know i want the book I'll listen to the preview and go like, eh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not that guy. Yeah, you, uh, need, you need to hear the narrator first. But outside of even Audible, there's also uh, podcasts, obviously. And my absolute favorite podcast is, um, well, I have two, but Dan Carlin. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you'd heard Wrath of the Cons on Hardcore yes, History. That's what got me hooked on Hardcore History. So Wrath of the Cons, I thought was just absolutely amazing his work on the second world war um on rome uh, i've pretty much devoured most of it and it's all just stellar um but then of course that's what got me hooked and then then he reeled me in with his uh, common sense which is okay. his political sure. podcast, uh which i just find absolutely wonderful it's we talk about therapeutic uh, experience of twitter this is a very therapeutic experience of digesting things like the current election because uh, i find his observations and his viewpoint uh, n- n- not only does it match enough with me that i can go yeah 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 but it's also novel enough that i go like oh i haven't actually thought about that angle and i mean that's really the most rewarding kind maybe that's not always the most uh, challenging kind but it's the most rewarding when you both generally agree with the vantage point and you also or continually bombarded with novel takes on uh, on the um, on the subject. Yeah, Dan's amazing. He's uh, he's been on the podcast yeah, as well. Yeah, I've had him on the show. He uh, I gotta go and listen to that. Oh, he's great. Yeah, I mean, he talked a lot about as he called it copywriting your faults, and he talked, for instance, about how he would always get criticized for jumping into the red. He would whisper, and then he would talk really loudly, and he got chastised forever. Everybody wanted at the time this very classic kind of deep voiced and now uh, it's just- radio personality. And then it flipped like five or 10 years later. They're like, wow, it's so great that you have this unique personality on air. And he's like, yeah, OK, that liability has now become an asset and uh, great, great story. Yeah. Really sweetheart of a guy, too. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that sometimes hit, sometimes don't. They don't always have a ready answer, but what purchase of $100 or less has most positively impacted your life in recent memory? And it doesn't have to be exactly 100 or less, but uh, just a a non-expensive purchase yep. that is really oh, positive. I, I have the question ready right here. Okay. Um, I bought a um, skateboard uh, about two months ago, mm-hmm. which has a funny story in itself. Like I, I watched uh, Casey Neistat. Is that how you sure. say it? Yeah, Casey Neistat. Um, his thing on, um, on the, um, those new electrical, um, skateboards, oh, the boosted boards, boosted boards. That's what Mm -hmm. it was. Right. And I thought like, oh my God, this is awesome. I need to get a boosted board. And I went onto the site and first I was like, why, what? I can't buy it. There's like a version two out or something. And like, it took forever to find out that just, they had a lot of demand and they weren't shipping right now. Anyway. Okay. I signed up for that. And then they're like, oh yeah, we'll ship it to you in three months. And I went like, shit, I was excited about the skateboard now. <laughs> so I went online and found a manual version, so to speak. Um, I used to skateboard <laughs> back in, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid, but literally had not skateboarded in 20 years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I happen to live right now out here in, in California where I'm just the perfect um, distance away from lunch that a skateboard is just what I need. Like if I walk, it's like, just over 15 minutes and I don't always want to spend like half an hour on on the road yeah. there and back and it kind of also is too short to kind of take a car that feels ridiculous but a <laughs> skateboard is just perfect like I can get there in like five minutes on mm-hmm. the skateboard and it's just fun and the skateboard was like 120 bucks or something and not only is it a lot of fun it's one of those things where you're like okay I haven't skateboarded in 20 years first of all like the basics are the same but the skateboard is still a good bit better. I don't know what happened in, in 
wheel technology and whatever, but the free rolling nature of a good skateboard today is just amazing. Um, they really just don't require that much effort, but still just enough effort that you actually feel good about it because you're like, hey, this is actually kind of exercise and I'm stretching into which actually the boosted board wouldn't. So I don't even know if the boosted board, when it arrives now, I, I take it, maybe I wouldn't even do that, right? <laughs> I just landed here because, and also even better, a, a skateboard is, is 100 bucks and a boosted board is, I don't know, 1,000 bucks or something. It's up there, yeah. I have a boosted right, board. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing. If you want to no. commute on a skateboard, um, like you're not going to go 10 miles on a, on a manual version. At least most people wouldn't. And a boosted board, you realistically could do that. So yeah. I'm still kind of curious about it, but I've just loved that skateboard. I'm, and it's yep. funny because... I'm a pretty big car nut and like I've had the good fortune to enjoy all sorts of cars and, and have all sorts of opportunities to do that still. But for the last, since I got that skateboard, I've not really touched them. <laughs> and, I, mean, I work from home and so I don't get a lot of opportunities to otherwise drive. Like I get to take my son to school sometimes in the morning and that's about it. Otherwise I don't need to be anywhere. Right. So lunch was usually the one time where, okay, I'll just go somewhere for lunch, just in part for the fun of it. And now I don't have that, but because I just, I skateboard, I just mm -hmm. skateboard to lunch every time. And it, it's awesome. What kind, do you know offhand what kind of skateboard it it's is? It's like a short, it's kind of like an oxymoron. It's a short long board. So okay, it's got it. made like a long board in terms of it's not for making tricks and so on. The wheels are relatively large. It's, it is for making Actually, not commuting, but it is for transportation more than than tricks and so on. But it's not so long that it kind of feels like a huge thing. Like I a just, surfboard, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I just I can I can pick it up. It doesn't weigh very much, and it's just perfect for skating over to a to a restaurant, sitting down, eating a sandwich in the gorgeous Southern California sun, and skateboarding back. <laughs> yeah, the boosted board. I so really? to, I think that first of all, you've uh, accidentally done some very good prep work if you do decide to use the boosted because. You do not want to be, uh, I know a lot of kind of 30 something, 40 something year old guys who have not touched a skateboard and they go straight to a boosted board, which is. Yeah, and like they fall out and break their arm. You right? have to be, it's a, it's a high powered vehicle. I, I, I have one about 50 feet from where I'm sitting and it's a, it's a fantastic device. But what I've realized is I don't have enough self-preservation instinct, nor <laughs> to not go an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. To realize just what I'm doing, uh, and I also just have a history of of flash flashing back to when I was 16 and trying to do things I did then and ending up hurting myself. So, what the coolest, most surreal use of the boosted board for me is finding a very gradual hill and carving uphill because the oh, danger okay. is really low and it's just the oddest feeling imaginable it's kind of like surfing up a wave uh without having come down at first it's it's a very surreal fun experience so that's that's where i would start and definitely do not set it at the fastest setting when you <laughs> <laughs> when, when you, you first, first get, get it. it when you first get yeah, it i gotta get a helmet too I, I don't really have a helmet for this small board i'm not driving where there's really any cars and and so forth but i, I remember i tweeted about the boosted board and some guy was like dude be careful with that i just cracked my skull yeah you so, got a helmet is a must-have yes, uh, yes what is the this now this is doesn't have to be monetary but what is the best or most worthwhile investment that you've ever made or one that comes to mind. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I mean, it could be money, time, energy, any other resource. For instance, I had this woman on my podcast, Amelia Boone, uh, who's the world's most successful obstacle course racer. And she's also a full-time attorney, but she ponied up for her first toughest mother competition. It was like 450 bucks. And that was a big deal at the time. I mean, that, that was quite an outflux of cash, but that created an entirely new career for herself. Right? So it, it could be just about any investment of any type of resource. Uh, does does anything come to mind, or really? Uh, yeah, good? yeah. Um, about um, so, I've been into photography for I don't know ten plus years, mm -hmm. but I had an affliction point about three and a half years ago, where I bought a uh, Leica mm -hmm. um, digital camera, which is like I was into photography, but I wasn't like, oh yeah, let me spend. Seven thousand dollars on a camera and another three thousand dollars on a lens. You're like ten thousand dollars for a camera is fucking ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, after I 
bought that camera, I have captured more memories in the last three years of better quality of just feeling like I absolutely aced the shot than anything. Like I look back, if, if I took one thing away from from the last three years that I would feel in 20 years, it would be the Leica. If I hadn't had that and if I hadn't dove into that world, which then in turn led me to just care more about photography, more about capturing precious moments, especially with kids, um, I'd be really sad in 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm just, it's one of those things where a ton of money for uh, for a camera, especially since you can get good cameras even on your, your phone today. But the, the difference it's meant to me to capture all those priceless moments on a just not just a good camera, but a freaking amazing camera has been priceless. Well, the price was twenty thousand dollars, but <laughs> like the value has been priceless. Um, what, what did what is the model? What were the uh, the M two forty M two forty? That's the camera, and what is what is your preferred lens? Yeah, it's it's a fifty millimeter Summerlux one point four. The good thing about uh, Leica is like I bought those things new and don't have to do that. Uh, obviously, you can buy them used and save a good chunk. And then they, they kind of retain their value. That unlike a disposable Canon something that's worth $0 in three years, a can, or like a lenses actually retain their values pretty well. Um, part of it, like, it's just the lens has been the same for, I don't know, like it's been around for 100 years or something. Well, actually, literally 100 years. I think they just celebrated their 100 year uh, birthday. And the lenses for a very long time have been around and can be used on all cameras. So it's a very sort of, I feel like, investment kind of thing. Um, and I've just been incredibly pleased with it. So for anyone who kind of, I thought it was just totally weird. Like the weird thing about the Leica is it doesn't autofocus. You have to focus the lens yourself. And it does it through this weird system called the range finder, where you look through the viewfinder and you see two images on top of each other that are ghosted. It sounds absolutely bizarre when you try to explain it and it's hard to explain. And then you have to line these two ghost images up on top of each other. That's when you know the picture is in focus. And I had such a disbelief in that. Like I started reading this guy, Steve Huff. I think it's stevehuffphoto.com, who's a big Leica guy and got me hooked on this stuff. Um, I started uh, reading about it and I still couldn't wrap my head about it. I, but I saw his pictures and I saw the package. Like it's like a camera. One of the advantages is that it's tiny. Like I had a big honking camera or Canon camera for a while and I ended up never using it because it just, I don't want to carry around a kilo on my back <laughs> um, versus the, the Leica is a lot smaller. And uh, I just, I couldn't get my head around it. So I went to lensrentals.com and I rented the camera. I think you can do that for like 150 bucks or something. And I spent a weekend with it. And it was, I won't say it's the same as the Ruby experience because it isn't, but it, it smells a little like it. It was one of those things where it's just like, oh, this is totally awesome. And just that weekend from that uh, lens rental rental, I have some of my favorite pictures of gold right Very away. Cool. Right. And you just go like, yeah, this is totally worth it. Uh, are there any resources that have helped you to improve your photography or habits or exercises, yep. anything? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of good books. Um, I think it's called Understanding Exposure. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. That was probably one of the first primers I read on just like, oh, what are these three angles of ISO and shutter speed and aperture? getting a basic understanding of that but then part of it really again came with with the tool which i mean i've been interested in photography before at the like and i i thought i took pretty good pictures but i just became much more interested in finding out how to do great photos with the Leica because i i got a couple of hits where i went like oh shit this looks as great as if any photographer i could have hired took this photo let me really understand that um it's funny one of the great resources lately has been Instagram. Instagram has really transitioned for me from when I first started using it and then stopped using it where it was just everyone posted pictures of like their shitty iPhone pictures of whatever that looked like in 2009 or whenever it premiered. I never thought that was that interesting. And now it's transitioned to it's more of a distribution channel that fantastic photographers using high-end gear use Instagram to distribute their photos which means it just makes it so easy to follow really good photographers and get super inspired by how they do composition or color or, or anything else. And that has, 
led me to just be more interested in developing that eye um, and developing the you know, sensibilities for what is a good picture, how does composition work, what is white balance, like all these things I sort of kind of knew but didn't really practice. Mm -hmm. And then post Leica, I kind of went like, all right, I'm not just going to know what these things are. I'm going to internalize what these things are and I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to take great photos. The I, I want to second the recommendation for understanding exposure. That's uh, Brian Peterson with a B R Y. That's a great book, and it's short. It's 176, beautifully illustrated. Lots of great pictures, and it's 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 the it gives you the toolkit of basic vocabulary and concepts so that you can then be a self sufficient learner. Yes. Uh, so on on the subject of beauty, like. Uh, we could talk about photography, but I want to actually throw out a question from our mutual friend, uh, Toby, so the CEO of Shopify. He, he said, DHH is a software craftsperson. And the question he wanted me to ask is, what is beautiful code to you and what makes it so? Great question, because it is one of those things where you can just keep on pulling on the thread, right? Uh, I think there's a bunch of technical things in the same way that you can look at a at a good picture or a great lap on a racetrack where you can go, just go like, oh, there's the rule of thirds here. And like that places the subject just in this part of the photo. And like uh, the white balance is set just so and so on and so forth. With um, programming, we have these things called pattern languages um, where you can use to describe sort of aspects of the code and can talk about the different techniques that you use. Um, for me, if I had to name just one, um, I'd say composed method, which is this notion of breaking down a piece of software such that everything within an individual unit, as we call them methods in object-oriented program, is on the same level of abstraction and that it keeps decomposing at the same level of abstraction. So when you're making a whole system, you start at a very high level telling the machine to do something, right? And then to actually have that done, you have to break that down and break that down and break that down and break that down. And I find that the most effective technique that I have for, for doing that is really composing the method system. We stay at the same level of abstraction. We stay in the same sort of visual style of what the code is. Some code is very mechanical of like, oh, we're adding one to an array or whatever. Uh, something very machine-like and something is very high level as in describing the outcome we're, we're searching for, like uh, withdraw from account or something like that, right? Like to withdraw a, a certain amount from an account, you need to do some mechanical steps. You need to deduct from this one, add to another one, maybe add to an event log, blah, 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 all these steps. But if you can describe the system in such a way that when you dive in, it's easy to understand, right? Like that you don't have to understand everything down to the nut and bolt to understand the system at a high level. That's a very direct uh, signal of quality to me that I open up any piece of code in Basecamp and it kind of reads like a great table of contents hmm. that you dive through. Okay, this is what this is the argument they're trying to make. Uh, this is how it breaks down into individual steps. I can dive into any of the particular essays if I want, but I also don't have to, right? Like I can still understand what's happening and what the programmer is trying to do from that concept. So that's one aspect of it on sort of a conceptual level. And there's a bunch of these wonderful patterns that help describe how to conceptually make good code. There's a bunch of principles about um, uh, low uh, coupling and high cohesion, these are some of the sort of the classics. And then there's just sort of sometimes also the visual style, which to me matters greatly as well, um, which Ruby just does a really good job at in, in the sense that it removes a lot of what we like to call line noise, like characters you have to add because um, that's easier for the system to interpret. So, for example, when I started with PHP, I don't know if this is true anymore. Every line had to end with a semicolon. That's how the interpreter knew that like, okay, there's a new instruction coming, right? Mm -hmm. There's no semicolons at the end of the line in Ruby. And just that simple change cleans things up a bunch. So what I like to uh, do in Ruby code is to reduce every method or class to the least amount of mechanical noise. Mm -hmm. That what's left is a pure description of the conceptual work that needs to happen. Um, maybe that sounds a little floaty, but it's just that there aren't 
like the bolts aren't exposed, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's like um, you're sort of like we don't use 10 screws and we don't make them show if five screws can do and we can hide them under sort of a cover, right? Mm-hmm. And then not only that, it's not just about making the veneer look good. It's kind of like that quality of the unseen. As you keep unwrapping and unpacking the code and diving deeper into it, scratching the surface ever deeper, it's just turtles all the way down. Mm-hmm. It keeps sort of <laughs> doing that all the way through to the final instruction, at least the final instruction that the programmer can see um, once the Ruby interpreter takes over and, and produces something that becomes machine code. Perhaps that's completely impenetrable, but at least the code that the programmer has to understand like it just like a wonderful rabbit hole that you don't mind falling down through. Mm-hmm. And does, does, uh, do elegant, is there any correlation between elegant code and clean prose? If you take someone who's a really, not just a functional coder, like you said, who can kind yes. of get the job done by using gum and band-aids, not that, right. but someone who's an elegant coder in your view, when they, when they then write prose, let's just let's just for the time being assume they're in English. Yes. It is it also clean? Is it logical that, and flow well? That's what I find. I find that there's a high correlation between people who are able, at least in high level programming languages like Ruby, to produce elegant, beautiful code and people who are clear thinkers. And if you're a clear thinker at this level of abstraction, um, you tend also to be a clear writer. It's not always true, and it's not true for all domains. There are certain, I think, areas of programming that is less about sort of juggling conceptual terms and finding just the right word for a class or a method that are more mechanical in nature, and that doesn't take anything away from the skill that it takes to do that. That's not the kind of programming that I'm interested in. That was the kind of programming that I thought I, I would never be interested in. The kind of programming that I fell in love with was this high conceptual level where it really is a lot more like writing prose and like phrasing and presenting your argument in a logical, methodical manner that's easy and clear to digest for a reader. Because I think at this level of abstraction, and probably at all levels of abstraction, but here more than, than other places, we're not writing for the machine. We're writing for your fellow programmer or for yourself in X amount of time from now, right? Like, again, that's true for all kinds of programming, but it's even more true the larger the system becomes and the more complex it is. And modern information systems today are quite large and quite complex on all sorts of levels, right? And we are in a fight to push back against that complexity. The natural state of complexity from a programmer taking a problem that they're trying to solve and then the first draft is very high. The first draft of anything is shit. That goes for prose. It goes for, I'm sure, well, I don't know. I'm assuming music. And it goes for all sorts of creative endeavors is that the first draft, not often that good, right? Like just like the, the first the try of the joke. Um, you have to refine it. And that's where, that's what I really love. I, I really love actually just, Getting something working, like that's not the interesting part of me. Being the editor, refining it and improving it until it's as good as it can be, that mode of iteration is just awesome. And that's that's where I extract all my flow on that. I think it's in that mode that I produce all the code that I'm proud of. It's very, it never happens that I write a piece of code and then I'm instantly proud of that. That just, it's not how it works. You have to go through the drafts and you have to go through the revisions to get to a place that truly shines. Now, I uh, I don't code, but I wonder if it works in the reverse as well. Meaning people who have really, everybody thinks, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people think they're good at writing. Very few people are really, really elegant and able yes. to remove the extraneous thoughts and the equivalents of ums and ahs yes the if if you had to pick or let me rephrase the question if you had to pull people from who were good at other disciplines to train them to code because you wanted them to learn really quickly or to be able to learn really quickly who would you pull from right so for instance if if i wanted to make good i'm just making this up but like good mma fighters but i couldn't pull from 
wrestling or anything else, who would I choose? I'd probably grab some gymnasts, right? Right. But because they have these these attributes that I know will translate quite well. Uh, what is that for coding? Like, if if you could pull from any other discipline or, um, for say learning Ruby or Ruby on Rails quickly, and you wanted to put together your team who had the highest likelihood of success in a short time frame, who who would they be? Um, I think uh, good journalists. Uh, that's a subclass of good writers, which are focused on sort of uncovering the mystery and the story and explaining it in the simplest terms possible is uh, something that just at least intellectually appeals to me. I haven't actually seen that um, transposed that often. I don't remember actually talking to that many uh, journalists who turned programmers. There's been some, but not that many. But that's sort of like the idealized form, I think, where someone has the clear thinking to really investigate a problem deeply and then also have the writing chops to present that to an audience. Um, what I've seen more have been people coming from other sciences. We've talked about the scientific method. I think that's absolutely a uh, huge leg up. When people who have internalized the scientific method aren't as likely to be the people who are just like, well, there's a bug. Like, that's just a computer. That's just how it works. I don't know what's going on. There's always an explanation. Nothing is magic. Nothing is voodoo. It's just because you don't have the pieces yet. So if you have the discipline of following the scientific method, then you have a leg up in that department, that's for sure. And then at least some share of people who work in, in those domains are also really good and clear writers. So I think perhaps that's an even better combination of, of someone who has the internalized the scientific method uh, to a T and, and also happen to write things that are digestible for normal humans. Sometimes that's a little hard for People work in academics, um, which I, which is what I like about the journalist act angle is that like usually that's more practical, more pragmatic in the sense you're not trying to impress some professor. You're trying some to committee. keep the attention of uh, of a reader who presumably should get something out of the story that they're left with, right? Um, so that's just off the cuff. I've met programmers though from all domains that have turned out to be excellent and programmers from all sorts of backgrounds that have turned out to not be so excellent. <laughs> so I don't know if there's a direct correlation here other to say that perhaps programming of of all the sort of, I don't know even if you can characterize as scientific fields, but programming is very open to people from different walks of life. I've met people, it's such a wide span of backgrounds that end up doing well in programming that uh, I really like that um, idea of like, uh, this is what programmers look like. And then you see like all sorts of different people, shapes, sizes, colors, backgrounds, genders, whatever. And uh, the machine doesn't care. Right. <laughs> right. Like the machine, yeah, the doesn't, machine care doesn't care how tall you are yeah. or whatever. There's no discrimination in, in that sense. I mean, algorithms and so on encapsulate sometimes human biases and so forth. But in at least in the pure sense of, of the programmer and the programming language, I think there's just such a discrimination free zone between that direct interface. Then move outside of that, try to go to Hacker News or sometimes GitHub pull requests and, and you'll see the all too human side of uh, people interacting, which is full of all the biases and bile and whatever else you'd expect out of humans. And programmers are no better, perhaps even worse in some regards in that uh, aspect. So, so just, uh, just a few more questions. Uh, I, I know we could, uh, we could keep going, but I want to let you get back to your family. Uh, the, so just two or three more. If you could have a, one gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would you put on it? Hmm. That is a uh, non-commercial. Yep. Yep. So in part one message, uh, to a lot of people, um, I'm trying to see if, see that, that's kind of like the on the spot kind of be brilliant. Like, I wish I could just come up with, uh, <laughs> like, just do it. And I was original in, uh, yeah. in saying that, um, we can, unfortunately I, I don't think I am. Um, well, we can take a different uh, direction, uh, to get to a similar destination. And that is, you mentioned the Coco Chanel quote earlier. Yep. Are there any other quotes 
or maxims that you think of often or refer to often in your life? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's try to see if we can find one that's, uh, that's positive because uh, it's funny <laughs> you just mention it. Like uh, the thing that pops into my eye, mind is that um, Sinclair quote of like a man can't understand what his salary depends on him not understanding. But that's not exactly a um, <laughs> Mo- motivational poster for the office. <laughs> motivational poster that uh, <laughs> that go for all, right? Um, mm, I think I need more time, man. Like, okay. If, yeah. No, that's if, fair. If, if I need to do a full creative on that because you're like. Yeah, get this one shot at a poster. Damn well, it better be good, right? Like, I, I don't want to just put up a no, no, poop no. emoji or something like that and and have a laugh for a second. You got to treat this with some uh, yeah, no sanctity. No. Yeah, we but this is this is uh, this is a lifelong project. So <laughs> no, no rush for right now. Uh, what advice would you give your say twenty twenty five year old self, if anything? And if 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 you do have an answer, what? place where you are and what you're doing yeah i think uh the answer i usually have to that is is kind of like a meta answer or a cop-out but the trending on which angle you see it from and i'd say the answer is that there is no answer um that i find that this seal and and perhaps i've had that in the past as well is that you look for this trick you look for this like if i just knew this one thing everything would be great if i just somehow had this one event happen or whatever that people a lot of people embody too much into this just this one thing right when the answer is it's all of the things right and they're they're interdependent yeah yeah exactly not only the interdependent but there's no one thing that's just really gonna turn everything around like it just doesn't life isn't that simple unfortunately or fortunately um because it also just makes it that much more interesting right like the thread is really deep and you have to keep pulling maybe that's the quote we'll use gotta thread, keep <laughs> yeah you can keep pulling <laughs> keep pulling um, the thread what what uh not, not to interrupt but maybe a better question is what habit or habits do you wish you would developed earlier in your life Yeah, I hate to be a cop out on that too. I mean, like one of the things I, I look back on as as I look back on time is is I'm trying to um, what was it? Jason Bispart had a good uh, saying about this. About I think it was Native Americans who I'm butchering this, um, but when they were preparing, I think it was like a carpet or something, right? Like an intricate um, carpet that was sewn. Like they left the errors in. Mm-hmm. Because sort of as a reflection of that, that time has passed. And the errors of those ways are how we got to where we are. Right. So I don't think I would have gotten to where I am. Well, this is kind of a truism in itself, too. I wouldn't have got to where I am if I had taken a different path. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if I want to be somewhere else. Well, actually, I do know. I don't want to be somewhere else. I want to be where I am. Right? So I, if I want to be where I am, I have to take the path I took to get there. Um, I mean, that's kind of like a Yoda quote, which is <laughs> like complete bullshit. But I, I think that's actually true. I, that's why I try not to look back on like anything with regret. Like that's my regret minimization framework is basically to not treat anything as regrets, including regrets. So, um, so on that, then, do you have a favorite failure of yours? In other words, is there a failure or an apparent failure that set you up? for later success. Oh yeah, that's good. Um, let's see. Well, I tried to, um, when I was, uh, just starting with, uh, with the university again, I tried to get a job at a, um, at a number of software organizations in Denmark as a student helper. Right. And I was so fucking blatantly over ambitious that I blew every interview because I was like, Oh yeah. So like we're talking about this entry level programming position, like um, it, what possibilities are there for me to basically inflict the overall strategy of the organization? And people would go like, what, what the fuck are you talking <laughs> what about? What are you talking about? Kid? You're, just, you're just, kiddo. What are you, what are you talking about? You're just here to uh, like 
program this web card or something, right? Like you're not setting any direction for any IT or whatever, right? And of course, I mean, it was a very reasonable reply and I was being completely unreasonable in my request. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad that happened, right? Like, I'm glad I didn't end up um, sort of just taking a job somewhere. That I was unemployable for a while at least. <laughs> um until I met up with Jason and I tell, we uh, started working together as more like peers than a, a sort of me being an employee. I, I don't think I, I would make that. Actually, I don't think I know I wouldn't make that well good of an employee. I, I worked at a fair number of places before I ended up uh, working with base, with Jason at Basecamp. And I, uh, I, I don't know if I was always seen upon that positively because I kind of would stir shit way too often and uh, be perhaps way too critical about things that I didn't have any power or authority to change anyway, um, <laughs> which then ended up just in a situation that perhaps didn't make things better. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm kind of glad that like it didn't work out, right? Like mm-hmm. I, It's funny, I remember uh, just yesterday I saw this uh, Jack Ma quote, uh, the I think he's CEO of Alibaba in China, and he said like when uh, KFC first came to China, they needed to hire 35 people or something and like 36 people applied i was number 36 like he didn't get the job at kfc he ended up instead running the biggest uh, internet company in china right yeah so sometimes the the failures we have I, i'm a big believer of this the, many of the failures we have are flip side of the strengths we have and the other side way around too some of our best strengths are also some of our greatest failures. Mm-hmm. And it all it's all about the context that you happen to put those in. Sometimes you put in a context where all your strengths turn up as just failures and weaknesses. And sometimes you put in a context where the opposite is true and you really thrive, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what I, a uh, number of times when we've had to say goodbye to someone at, at base camp, I'm always like, this isn't because like you can't find somewhere else to be fantastic. This is because right now in this role, at this time, at this company, like the strengths that you have, they're not showing up as strengths. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I truly believe that. I don't, that's not just like, oh, let's say something nice to the person who's going out the door. It's uh, because I've seen it time and again, I've seen it in myself. I've seen myself fail in all sorts of situations for the same reasons that I would later succeed um, under whatever definition of success you want to use, at least my own personal definition of success, right? Mm-hmm. When it came to that. And I traced that all the way back. I remember when I was in high school, I would take great pride in the Fs I got. <laughs> I got an F in a number of subjects, including math in like senior year. And I would say like, yeah, I deserve an F. I put in no effort here. I intend to put in no effort. I have chosen <laughs> the F. Um, and then at the same time, I would say, well, that A plus or whatever I just got in this topic, yeah, I'm really proud of that because I put in the effort I and I wanted to do it and I was good at it. And sometimes I'd go like C, awesome. I put in 2% of the effort and I got C. That's that's more than fair. You're being generous, sir. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think that uh, you really have to look at that. And, and I look at that in public personas too, right? Like You have a lot of people who end up changing either – a community or an industry or a country or the world. And a lot of people will go like, well, that person is crazy or like they're, they're really a bad person in these, all these sorts of ways. Right. And you go like, yeah, like most sane people, well-adjusted wouldn't put themselves in this situation. (laughs) Most sane, well-adjusted people don't get up on the stage in the way that people who end up changing things do. Right. Because they're sane and well-adjusted and like uh, their swings aren't as big both their positives and the negatives, right? It's kind of like if you if you look at the curve, like if you want to stay around the medium, like you just, you don't swing that much. But if you want to reach the peak, you also got to take the, the bottom. Yeah, you got to take the valley. Yes. And then it's all about choosing to be response able. And that's where, I mean, there are so many tools that at least I've found, and it sounds like you've found helpful, like stoicism and trying to put those into practice so that you can try to get the benefits of that pendulum without <laughs> yes. suffering through necessarily. Which I think at least just being aware, right? At like least being aware. Know exactly. that, like, I know that like, okay, I have strengths in certain areas that they're kind of like genes. They can express themselves in 
terrible negatives, right? Like sometimes I truly do wish I could just keep my damn mouth shut, right? Like <laughs> life would be a lot easier for both me and a whole lot of other people if I could just shut the fuck up. But also, I mean, at least the positive contributions I've made sometimes have come because I can't shut the fuck up, right? Yeah, so yeah, I just you got to accept it in, in, in full honesty that like, okay, the good things come with the bad things. Yeah. And like if, if you want that, then... And, and that's not justification. It, it's not that you shouldn't try to work on it. Like I, I try to work on it, and and then still sometimes you regress to to your habits and and your sort of uh, proclivities. But yeah, it's the self awareness and uh, and being able to, like you said, develop that self awareness at the very yeah, least. And put yourself in situations where you express the better side of it more often, right? Like I don't, for example, like. Oh, I have self awareness that I'm a jerk all the time. Justifies you being a jerk all the time, right? Like, right. Hey, if you know that there are certain situations that sort of express that part of you, try to not put yourself in those situations as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I was I was being interviewed recently, and uh, this part didn't make it to print, uh, but I was asked you know, a bunch of short questions, and one was, you know, if you had to attribute your success and to an attribute, what would it be? And I said, impatience. And then they, like three, four questions later, they said, what do you think you most need to work on? And I said, impatience. Yes. And uh, what, exactly. I've, what I've realized about myself is that I, I'm better at designing systems than I am at hands-on managing people. I just don't have a soft touch. I'm too, uh, I, I, I'm too indelicate. And uh, that means I just need to have good systems and then say, hire one person who doesn't require the kid gloves and have them manage people. Fantastic. Then it works out. But if I put myself in circumstances that require a lot of tact and diplomacy, well, it's going to be a shit show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I uh, this has been really fun to catch up. Where can people learn more about you, learn more about Basecamp? Um, are there any things or places that you'd like them to check out? Sure. So as we just talked about, I have that pillow I scream in with some regularity on Twitter. It's at DHH. Uh, I'm also at DHH on medium.com where I kind of scream for longer periods of time into the pillow. <laughs> <laughs> long form screaming. Yeah. yeah, long form screaming. Um, I'm on Instagram at DHH uh, 79. That's a little more uplifting. I have post some of my photography and a bunch of other people's photography, a lot about cars and racing and other things I find beautiful and pretty. Um, and then, of course, uh, my life's work, Basecamp. It's basecamp.com. Um, anyone who's trying to sort of get their company organized and put things on the right track and are tired of being stuck in emails and unread counters and chat room treadmills, um, should really give that a try. Uh, Ruby on Rails, if you're into programming or want to learn how to be a programmer, now is never been a better time. It's never been easier to get started, just as hard as ever to become an expert, but it's never been easier to get started. Um, and finally, um, we have a great podcast at Basecamp called The Distance um, the distance.com. You can find it on iTunes as well, where we profile companies who've been around, stuck around for 30 years or more, as we like to, uh, Jason calls them stay ups. Uh, the <laughs> easiest thing in business is to start. The hardest thing is to stay. So that's what we aspire to ourselves. Um, base camp through the lineage of 37 singles has been around for 17 years now, uh, as we've talked about, I've worked on Basecamp itself for like 13 years now, and same with Ruby on Rails. Uh, I really believe in, in staying the distance and going the distance. Perhaps that's also why I love endurance racing so much. But um, yeah, I think that's a good summary of, uh, of the places to find me and uh, my screams in the pillow. <laughs> Well, David, thank you so much for the uh, the time. There's so many more things I'd love to ask, but uh, this has been a great catch up. And hopefully, I mean, you've done so much racing, and I know we were exchanging uh, some messages. Probably, I guess it was yesterday, and you mentioned that uh, you haven't done yet any rally racing. I, I I think you would love it. So we should definitely make some time for maybe doing a uh, Team O'Neill 
uh, in New England or something like that at some point in the future. I think you'd immedi- immediately kick my ass, which is I'm <laughs> totally okay with, but it's so much fun. I think you'd just have a blast uh, because of, for all the reasons you already enjoy the racing, I think you would love it. But uh, I want to let you get back to your evening. And uh, thanks for being so generous with your time. Thanks for having me, man. This was a blast. And for everybody listening, the show notes, as usual, will include links to everything that uh, David mentioned at the end, and certainly the books and so on resources that he mentioned throughout. We'll dig up as much as possible. So you can find that at fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, forward slash podcast. And until next time, and as always, thank you for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, etc. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. Take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they'd put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15,000, which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than five dollars a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me, uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account, but just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast, it's free. There's no downside that I can think of. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. I reached out to these Finnish entrepreneurs after a very talented acrobat introduced me to one of their products, which blew my mind in the best way possible. It is mushroom coffee. What on earth is this? Well, it includes chaga mushroom, 
very powerful antioxidant, considered a superfood. I was introduced to chaga by Laird Hamilton, the king of big wave surfing of all things. And it includes another mushroom that is considered a nootropic, a smart drug, and this is lion's mane. In the entire packet, you just add it to hot water, it tastes like coffee. There is only 40 milligrams of caffeine, so less than half what you would find in a cup of coffee. So you, I do not get any jitters, I do not get any acid reflux or any type of stomach burn, and it put me on fire for an entire day, and I only had half of the packet. So this stuff is really amazing. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement right now. This is the answer. So it is legal. It will not give you visuals. That's something else. And you can try it right now by going to foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. That is four sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C, foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim and use the code Tim to get 20% off your first order. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim.